you are recording. Thank you. Uh, my apologies up front. I do have a hard stop for myself at seven o'clock with a prior engagement that I can't get out of tonight. Um, but uh, I will leave you all in the capable hands of Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Um, this is being recorded, so I will be able to uh, enjoy it in my own time, watch it on YouTube later on tonight. Nothing better than catching back up on budget workshops on YouTube. Um, but I do appreciate everybody coming out tonight for this. Um, tonight is the uh, third and final budget workshop for the fiscal year 2022 budget for Town of Wethersfield. And tonight we have actually some additions that maybe Gary will go into later on, but we will be hearing from the board or library and uh, the library board is graciously um, come on board to, uh, to uh, present with uh, Brooke tonight or offer some backup for Brooke tonight. Um, after that, we have Board of Education giving us kind of a rundown. Uh, we're gonna ask some questions about uh, some of the uh, comments that uh, were brought up last night at their uh, finance meeting on um, federal funds that are coming into the board, uh, either through ESSER funds, ARP funds, um, and how we're going to see those funds affect uh, FY22 budget. Um, after the Board of Ed, Gary, did you talk to um, Chris Monroe? Is he going to be on? Uh, hasn't necessarily been confirmed. It's kind of an extension of the Board of Ed conversation. Okay. Uh, but I believe it will be available. He at is. At that point. And then, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And then after that, uh, Mike O'Neill will wrap up some of his um, department's um, subcategories in finance. So uh, I don't want to keep everybody. Uh, Amanda, hopefully you're not driving your park somewhere safe right now. Um, and uh, Brooke, the floor is yours for the library. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Rell. Um, Gary, do I have the ability to share screen? You should shortly. Try now. Okay. No? Hold on. So thank you for uh, meeting with us this evening. Um, the library, uh, as many of you know, um, is truly one of the treasures of the town of Wethersfield. Uh, we are here to provide for the information, educational and recreational needs of the Wethersfield community. Um, if you haven't read this cover to cover, um, there's a great chapter in here about the library. For those of you who would like the spark notes or cliff notes version it's up on your screen right now for fiscal year 1920 um, and you can see our statistics uh, for that a, a very noteworthy statistic is uh, during the last three months 6,547 people attended programs virtually from April to June last year that is just remarkable um, and, and so I, I think that's just an, an interesting thing at the beginning of the pandemic, we were able to reach and have that many uh, virtual uh, interactions or views. Um, it's, it's fantastic that we have that type of reach. And so that is a pandemic uh, silver lining. Um, the work of the library continues. So the budget book that you all have um, really focuses um, on the previous fiscal year through December of 2020. Um, so it's kind of an 18 month look back, um, but at some point we have to start stop writing. Um, and so we usually do about an 18 month look back. On uh, this next slide is that the library, the work of the library has continued. Um, we have had a phased uh, reopening and uh, we're really grateful to the Central Connecticut Health District that the library was able to put in place 
uh, preventative measures to keep the library and the community as safe environment as possible and to be able to open our doors. And uh, a big thank you to Charles Brown and Gary Evans and the staff that work as a part of the Emergency Operations Center um, for their help during their help and guidance during this time. Um, the library staff have been hard at work um, and uh, have been busy throughout, throughout this entire time. And since July, July through the end of March, we've had an average of 125 people visit the library daily. Normally we're between four and 500 people. Um, and so that is just, I, I think is, is great that we're having that many visitors. Um, I think it's, uh, I think as people start to become vaccinated and feel more increasingly more comfortable going out and about in their community. Um, and as our hours expand, we only expect that those to numbers to tick up. Um, we have circulated, again, this is July through March, over 130,000 items have circulated. Um, what is interesting is our overall CERT compared to the previous fiscal year is actually down um, 47%. And our attendance is down as well, but if you, analyze the numbers, less people are grabbing more and more material to, to check out. Um, and so when they're walking out the door, it isn't with just a couple of books, it's with like five or six books. So um, that's why our CERC, um, we're down less people, but our CERC is, is only half down, which is just kind of interesting when you're looking at the numbers. We have answered over 12,900 reference questions through the end of March uh, in a variety of ways that we reach people. Um, and staff have continued to deliver programming and that includes uh, the Friends funded Take and Make and Grab and Go kits. Um, and that's to over 4,400 people. And again, we did a lot in April as well, but those numbers aren't final quite yet. Um, we continue with our collection development maintenance for our online and print collection. We were heavily involved uh, the first half of the year through the for the 2020 census. Um, we did a 19th Amendment celebration project and we're currently preparing for the 2021 summer reading um, that we're hoping the friends will fund again this year. Um, and we continue to coordinate with the schools um, with online resources and virtual class visits. Um, and the staff, we, we continue to quarantine, disinfect items that are returned to us and reshelve items that are returned to us. Um, and we're hoping that as this further guidance comes out from the CDC, um, that we'll be eliminating uh, the quarantine and disinfecting. Um, um, but we're just triple checking the science on all of that. Um, so you may have seen guidance on that. Um, and so we're, we're looking to do that. Um, it, we started reopening in June, 2020. We are currently open for the past several months, over six months, we have been open 35 hours a week. Starting this week, we'll be open 38 hours. Starting the week of May 17th, we will be open 44 hours per week is the plan. And then after Memorial Day weekend, we will be open to the public 54 hours a week. Um, so we are excited uh, uh, for, that, for that to happen. It is important to note that several area libraries have just started reopening. Uh, Newington reopened today, where they actually let people into their building and today was their first day of that. Um, so, and they've had um, restrictions on their end that they weren't able to necessarily overcome. It's a very different layout of floor plan, but I am proud to say that we've been able to serve our public for quite some time uh, during this pandemic. Um, the examples you don't see up here on the screen is our behind the scenes work, which is a lot of processing of materials, general office work, ordering supplies, um, processing payments, um, you know, that kind of work. So that's the stuff that you don't actually, you know, that a lot, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on in the library. Um, I'm going to stop the share. 
Um, moving on to the proposed budget, which you should have in your budget books, we can just go through line by line, if you like. And we'll start at the top. Um, the first uh, 16 lines that you see there are, including myself, uh, I'm non-union, but below that lines two through 16 are union staff. Um, it's important to note that we are in union negotiations right now with the two library unions. Um, and so some of the lines, if you look at a line, like say number nine, office manager, you'll see that in the proposed budget, the salary line's the same because I don't know if there will be raises. Um, I did try to factor in each line if there was a step increase, um, but I've tried to factor other increases at the very bottom of the, of the salaries where it says other. I did try to put in a, a cushion of some sort, um, but I couldn't do it line by line because we just don't know. Um, and so union negotiations are plugging along and it's uh, been a pleasure working with Ken Plum as we've been moving forward. So we've had um, several productive, I would say productive meetings. Um, below line 16, we start with our non-union part-time staff. At the beginning of the pandemic or about a couple, I wanna say about a month or two in, at some point we did furlough 16 individuals um, and then slowly started bringing them back over the summer and into the fall. I still have two uh, part-time non-union staff that are still furloughed um, and we'll be sending letters to them in the near future for them to return or not. And they, a decision needs to be made whether they're going to plan to return or not. I have cut about over $20,000 out of the non-union part-time budget. Um, some lines I can predict pretty easily, um, but I did cut, you can see part some, just if you just pick a line, part-time library associates, I reduced that line by $5,000, anticipating I'm using them less. The furloughed staff in their, their letter, it did indicate that when they return, if we're able to bring them back, that they would more than likely have reduced hours. Um, and so, you know, that's reflected in here um, for the most part. So um, that's what's in there. The only, uh, there are no budget increase, uh, salary increases for the non-union part-time uh, as um, that are in here. Um, yeah, so there is, yeah, there is no uh, except minimum wage increase. And that would be for the library page line there is the mandated uh, minimum wage increase and that's part-time library pages. Um, uh, moving on is employee insurance. Again, these are costs that I, I, we don't have control over. I uh, ticked up a little bit. Health insurance ticked up a bit. Um, the pension uh, significantly ticked up a bit um, and defined contribution went up a bit and workers comp came down $20. Um, so the, all those lines, uh, you know, especially the employee insurance, health insurance, pension, the DC and the workers comp, we don't really have control over those costs. Um, so that that's where the real budget uh, increases is, 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 in, is in those lines. Uh, copying and binding remains the same travel training and dues remains the same professional services uh, remains the same and and professional services is our dno insurance that we need to have for the board of directors um, and we do check to make sure that we need that and we do um, we do check with the insurance and they say yes um, uh, programs we, we, we've kept that the same. Um, just because programs are virtual doesn't mean it, it costs less. Um, a, a, another pandemic silver lining is we are doing um, shared programming with other 
um, lo local libraries, which is something we would have never have thought of doing. Um, we recently did a genealogy workshop. We did a job series workshop with local like Newington and Berlin and Rocky Hill. Um, and so we're able to share the cost of a speaker, have multiple series and have a lot of people attending these programs. So those have been uh, well received. Um, and, and, uh, and the friends uh, have funded the summer reading. Last year they gave 6,000. This year I'm only asking them for 5,000 and the library board last night approved me to ask for $5,000 for summer reading. They still have, the friends still have to say yes. We hope that they will, um, but that's our, that's our programming. Uh, tech support services is, I just kind of put in a number there, you know, $80,000. I can spend well over a hundred without any much effort whatsoever. Um, and at the end of the year, if I do have le money left over, I do will make a drop of say 10,000 or 15,000 into say overdrive and we'll drain that through the year or hoopla, which will, in those, these are online, you know, eBooks or streaming movies or something like that and or you know so we will do that um but i'm careful not to give any particular vendor too much money um because they're eating each other alive and so i don't want to like commit and give a company more and then suddenly they're out of business and so i am very mindful of how much i give them at the end of the fiscal year and we check it. Um, and this year, I don't know that we'll be giving to overdrive because we feel like we have a healthy deposit at the moment, um, but we'll be uh, looking uh, to um, perhaps with Hoopla if we have any leftover money. Um, so, and the tech support also includes the cost for the shared catalog. We're part of multiple consortiums. One of our consortiums is our shared catalog and that saves all the libraries, the cost of a system, what's called a systems librarian. And uh, it costs us about, so half this budget is 40 grand and that's what that's for. Um, and it's well worth the cost. Um, so we're pleased about that. Custodial services, um, we, we, we have enhanced cleaning going on right now. Um, and I'll be working with Charlie to make sure that we're not doing, performative cleaning, <laughs> um, you know, and so we want to, you know, make sure that we really, you know, do need this, but um, I don't know that when we'll, we're probably at some point due to bid this out. Um, so this past year, it was this current year, it's $30,000. I did tick it up a little bit to $35,000. Um, the place has never been cleaner um, and I've had to pay for when we did close the library down um, a couple of weeks in January um, and we did do a couple of deep cleanings. So, um, you know, those costs are, you know, are born out of that. So I come out of that. So postage and delivery remains the same. The telephone uh, communications uh, remains the same. Um, if I can once again ever make a plug for voice over IP, I'm right on board. <laughs> um, it, it cannot happen soon enough. Uh, staff throughout the town, their handsets fall apart, voicemails get missed. Um, I get notice after notice that no one is supporting any of this equipment. It's already years and years out of date. Um, and so it's, it's just very difficult. I know that when Rocky Hill went to voice over IP, their library specifically, 50% 50, 50 of their call volume just vanished. Because you can answer, are you open with yes, we're open with a button and not a staff member. And so it would there would be a cost savings to town, I feel, um, because that's a lot of the questions. Are you open? And it's on our website, but some people need to hear a voice and we don't want to like deprive anybody of a voice and you'll get to a voice. But if half the questions are, are you open? You know, that's that's a problem. <laughs> um, the office machinery services is our RFID, which we're in the process of upgrading to Windows 10. And so thank you for last for this current year's um, CIP money for, for, for that upgrade. Repair and maintenance, we've kept the same at 4,000. 
uh, specialized agency of supplies. That's barcodes and um, things that we use for library, the library cards themselves. Um, so we've brought that budget down um, $1,500 from current year. Uh, building materials um, is, is we've kept it the same. We've blown through this budget, uh, this budget line, this current fiscal year. Um, and that's where a lot of the PPE is coming out of and other uh, cleaning as custodial supplies. Um, so we've blown through that. Um, general office supplies, we brought down this year um, a couple thousand dollars um, to $9,000. And um, Elaine, the office manager, was not thrilled with that. <laughs> um, it makes her very nervous, um, but I think my hope is, is that we'll be okay. Um, our book budget and other uh, material DVDs, uh, CDs, um, magazines, uh, I have dropped that budget by $7,000 in this current proposed budget. And um, more people are moving to streaming. You cannot buy a car now with a CD player. Um, audio so these formats and, and keep in mind my circulation on these materials is still good um but i'm trying to anticipate the future <laughs> as well um that these collections are shrinking and our budget should shrink as a result of that in addition we are um in a process of um slowly um uh putting less funding towards the nonfiction collection. Um, more people get nonfiction information um, online or fiction information, but nonfiction we'll say <laughs> online. Um, and if they're looking to um, find information about, you know, pick a, a, a famous person, um, they're more than likely going to want to look it up and find the quick fact online than to read, a, say, a biography. We're still purchasing biographies and autobiographies. We still purchase them and we're, we're doing fine, but we don't need to perhaps invest as much as we have previously because people are getting that information in different ways, which isn't bad. It's just that's what's happening, but you should ref your budget should reflect that as well. Um, in addition, I we do have, um, uh, and I'll get to this a bit later, but we do have supplemental income to help with this particular line as well. And finally, uh, the last line in here is IT equipment and uh, software. Um, the current year is about $7,000. Um, and this is the time of year, actually, we make end of year purchases. Um, and the reason I've increased this is because we are going to be transitioning to Gmail. And so um, we're using three different platforms and we need to move to um, the Gmail enterprise, as, you know, for an email system. And that's, I have to pay for every single account. Um, and so we're moving in that direction. There's going to be a cost associated with that transition. So um, that's what's that is budgeted in for. So it is an increase of uh, $31,967, um, which is a 1.55% uh, increase from the current uh, fiscal year. If there are um, cuts to the proposed budget, and I understand you all have a some very serious decisions that you'll need to make in the next few weeks. Um, the process is, is I make recommendations to the library board for their consideration. And my recommendation would strive to have the least amount of impact to the public as well as the staff and still maintain quality service. The library board would have a final approval of where those cuts would come from. Um, what would some of my suggestions be? Um, it, it obviously depends on the cut, but it, it probably less hours of operation. I'd be looking at weekend. I'd be looking at evening hours, um, less programming, either in person, which we're not doing right now, but virtually um, further reductions in the collections, both online and in print. Um, and then when you're looking at reducing, depending on the reduction, you're, you're, it, 
all of these things also translate into the reduction of the hours of the staff. And the first staff that gets hit is the part-time non-union. Um, and then we move towards union staff if, if it is a severe cut. Um, so that's, that's the process that, that we do. Um, a 1% cut to the library is say $20,000. 2% is 40,000. So that's, it's a $2 million budget basic, you know, so that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Um, the current uh, at the close of the current fiscal year, any portion of the appropriation that the library has received that is not expended, the library will hold a, a special meeting um, and votes on what are the year end transfers. And while I realize everyone would like a crystal ball of what the dollar amount would be with two months left of the fiscal year, it's too early. Munis is currently saying that the library's budget is 75% spent out. It is actually with payroll that I don't think has quite hit Munis yet. We're actually at 77% spent out. And I have four and a half, 4.5 payrolls to go. Um, so, you know, we're on track with what we were last year. Um, however, given my past history of getting blood from a rock, I do anticipate once again, having a cost savings. Um, unlike other, uh, other departments, the library, we cannot ever be overspent. It cannot happen. Um, Gary's budget doesn't come in and, and save me and neither in the, in the board of ed can't come in and save me if they have unexpended funds, that doesn't happen. Um, so we cannot be overspent. Um, I do anticipate that we will have a cost savings. I don't know what that dollar amount will be. I will know perhaps more right before the board meeting in May, the library board meeting in May, which I believe is the week before Memorial Day weekend. I will have a much better idea of what that amount will be, whether it'll be 5%, 10%, I'll know. Uh, I, think, I think I'll have a better idea. Um, and I'm trying to, we're in the process of starting to slowly wrap up spending now. Um, so other sources of funding, the, the assumption when the library board voted in, excuse me, early March on the what we call the preliminary proposed budget, um, the assumption was is that some of where I've cut from, say, in the book budget, would be offset from other sources. Um, so whether that's the friends of the library, investment income, donations, um, it's extremely important to note that these other sources are limited. They're often restricted in their usage and intended to supplement and not supplant the library's general operating funds. So for example, you may have heard about the American Rescue Plan. <laughs> the Weathersfield Library is slated to receive $20,000 approximately. However, we have to apply for it. And the terms of the grant is what I would call a tad restrictive. And it does not, and it specifically prevents me from what I like to call robbing Peter to pay Paul. So if you were to say, Brooke's getting 20 grand, we're gonna take 20 grand, that it's not gonna, it, I'm prohibited from from doing what you, what I would think I could be able to do. Um, however, my managers and I are in the process of coming up with a plan to have this funding help the Weathersfield community in some way move us forward through this pandemic. 
And, and so that is something that we are looking. So we're trying to view it as a positive, um, even though it may not help me initially the way I think it should help me. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a, it's a $20,000 yay for Weathersfield for the library. Um, but I have to get creative and whether that's some program on say workforce development or something for early childhood, we'll figure it out and we'll have those dollars stretch as far as they can go to benefit the Weathersfield community. Um, so we're in the process of that. Um, and it is, it is actually just like a blessing that this is, that, you know, it, it is coming, um, you know, and that in the town, what they're going to, and the board of ed will be getting with their money. It's that's, you know, it'll be help us the community move forward. Um, the library's investment accounts are thankfully hanging in there. I could not say that this time last year as they were tanking, um, but they came roaring back in early July or early June. Um, so, for example, the Showman Endowment. Um, uh, Jane Showman, she passed away about a decade ago, and the proceeds from the sale of her house came to the library. We can only use those funds for adult materials. So I cannot buy a children's book with those materials. Um, and we use uh, the income that's generated from that. And there's rules and restrictions of what you can and cannot do with that money. Um, but it is a blessing, and we do have funding there. And it's meant to be utilized and that's our intention is to utilize it. So that's why I feel very comfortable that we're able to reduce, um, you know, our library books another $7,000 because I'm expecting to use some of this investment income for that. Um, so there's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a real positive. Um, and another, uh, source of funding that we have is the Friends of the Weathersfield Library. Um, unfortunately, the large fundraiser that the Friends hold is a book sale. That generally brings between, say, six to $7,000 a book sale or so, depending on how, uh, it just depends. We're now down three book sales. So say we're down 20 grand for that alone. And that's money that's never going to be had <laughs> again. I've been very careful what I've asked the friends for. Um, so they do have some cash reserves. And I want to be very um, uh, careful what we do ask them for. Um, and so they, they're helping with museum passes. They help with um, uh, the take and make and grab and go. They were thrilled to fund that. And we were thrilled to have them pay for that. <laughs> Um, and uh, the public has loved it. Um, and so just want to be mindful that their income stream has dried up completely. They do not know if they're going to have a fall book sale. And then that would be four book sales. Um, but I am asking them for $5,000, um, which would kind of be the equivalent of a book sale for summer reading. And uh, fingers crossed that they say yes. Um, so the friends, our fundraising arm is, is, is hurting. Um, so that's sources of, of funding. Um, and as far as revenue that we generate for the town, which is the other side of the budget, right? So uh, any revenue we have brought in during the past year has been negligible. I would, I, I'm guessing it's less than $1,000. Um, our proposed budget revenue for the upcoming fiscal year is, is 5,000. The waiving of fines due to the pandemic and quarantine materials, which we're hoping will end this summer, um, we can't charge fines um, and people aren't coming in. Um, and then typically during the month of July, we do food for fines. So in the month of July, we're waiving fines anyway, if you bring us a can of soup for the food bank. Um, and that's a program that um, I'm too frightened to end because I'm scared of Kathy Backlin, but <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And people really like do, participating. Um, we did recently reinstitute our printing charges for printing from the computers. 
And that was driven because everybody wants to do their tax forms and I can't print tax booklets. That's too much paper and toner. So we did recently reinstitute that. Um, yeah, so that's the budget. And I've tried to anticipate every question, but I'm <laughs> and answer it. Um, but if anybody has any questions uh, for me or the board, by all means. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Uh, before I go, some questions. Anybody from the council with any questions for Brooke? Councilman Biggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Brooke. Um, question about the VoIP system, the voice over IP. Uh, do you have a estimated cost of what that would be? No, I do not. Um, it would be, a, I, I'm hoping maybe Michael Rell, I mean, I'm sorry, Michael O'Neill would have that. Um, I, I, I do not know. Okay. I do not know. And I'm assuming it would be connected with whatever the town is doing on the side of you. Absolutely. In the spirit of shared services, I am 110% on board with sharing voice over IP with the town of Weathersfield. Got it, thank you. 10%. Thank you. Former library board member, Councilwoman Peltier. So I just wanted to say that was a great presentation because I had a list of eight questions I was going to ask and you literally answered all of them. So well done anticipating all the questions. So I actually don't have any questions. I just wanted to let you know uh, you answered them all. So very good. Thanks. Thank you. I've got just a couple questions. Uh, the non-union part-time the two furloughed staff people if they do not come back would you be filling those positions so i would view them as hours um and the other people i'm at the bare minute it's like you have say a a a, a page position is like say it's it's not, but say it's funded for like a 40 hour work week, that's divided by like three or four people. Um, but I have reduced the hours down and people are looking to share hours. Um, I don't know if the people are looking to return um, or not, um, but it, it would not change the proposed budget. My anticipation was that they were returning. Um, and currently my, non-union part-time staff um we have to kind of remain competitive with other local businesses to a certain extent um and they are given raisins from time to time i did not put in a raise for this year um but you do need to give them some semblance of hours but many have been reduced from say 19 hours a week to say 12 or 10 and so then you start to lose commitment on their part because they're not they're just not getting enough hours of work um, and I have the work for them. Um, and it will only increasingly be so as more um, items are circulated, um, which will happen as we increase our hours and the public feels more and more comfortable coming out as people get vaccinated and whatnot. Um, there's just a lot more material to deal with and handle. So um, we've been dealing with it okay so far, um, but uh, yeah, I did I asked, I don't know how much more reduction I'm really going to do there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the 15 union uh, full-time and part-time yeah. staff, in your tenure as director, has that number gone up or has that stayed the same at 15? Um, I would say it's gone down. Okay. I believe I'm actually at 14. Um, I want to say I'm at 14. Uh, one of the positions, and I'm sorry, I just put the papers away. Um, it's Ellen. It's actually Ellen's line, old line. I want to say it's line five, and it went from 71,000 to 63,000. Mm -hmm. 
um, because she was step eight and then went down to uh, step, it, I dropped it to step one. I'm actually not looking to fill that position until the fall. However, I have to keep it fully funded because if I don't and I fill it next year and I've made the reduction here, it would be such a, you know, it's a librarian, it's jumping up 20 and it's like, why are you jumping it up in one year? So I've kept that line, but I'm actually not going to fill it until the fall. And so for the first quarter, we won't be paying someone out. So there is a savings there, but I can't reflect it in here because I'll be hit with questions next year of why did this salary jump from here to here? Um, I will have to pull out, you know, I'd have to pull it out of somewhere else. And so, right. yeah. And then you, uh, but then you anticipate a savings on that, so. I do anticipate a savings yep. on that. Okay. Uh, ARP funds of $20,000. Could any of that go to co uh, custodial services? Um, for enhanced cleaning, um, perhaps. Um, and so I have enhanced cleaning going on on Monday and Tuesdays as a midday cleaning. I'm looking to do that on Thursdays as well. But again, I'm checking with um, Charles Brown. I want to make sure that I'm not doing performative hygienic theater. <laughs> okay. And is that grant a competitive grant or is it a straight grant all libraries, all towns get through ARP? Um, I know that I, I, I have to, I'm not, I don't believe I'm competing with others. I'm competing with the requirements. Got it. Okay. If that and makes sense. I, but I can't, I think some towns may have gotten other buckets of money and they're not getting this but they got something we didn't get um so there were other grants that were out there that we were not eligible for for from the get-go and that was last you know say six or nine months ago okay and then and that maybe answered the other question i had did you receive any other funding either through state rescue plans uh through opm or anything I think that's answering your other you, you the question. Yep. Yeah, yep. not that I'm aware of. Um, and we've been looking and I thought initially we were eligible for something in, oh goodness gracious. Um, the fall probably. The fall, yeah, or I wanna say late summer. And yep. um, they, I think there was a lot of miscommunication with the state library that it turned out only a handful of libraries were eligible. And we all thought we were putting in um, for something and waiting for instructions that we never received. And then we we're like, what? Cromwell got something? What? <laughs> Why didn't we? And we weren't eligible. So that may be something we can talk to our delegation, legislative delegation about if there is any type of, I know there is some funds coming through OPM and the legislature for enhancement, summer enhancement, enhancement um, enrichment programs for kids. Do you do any school or like summer camps? No, I, I have seen um, the initial, some initial things on that. And I'm under the impression that's more for schools or parks and rec. Um, we don't, we haven't hosted anything like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Good. Thank you for your time. It's greatly appreciated. And yeah, so thank you. And good luck. <laughs> We're all going to need thank it. You. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank to, you uh, so much. Library board members. Good to see everybody back again. Thank you. Take care. Mr. Emmett, Mr. Kazaka, Chairman Carey, and I think we've got some members of the uh, Board of Ed on as well. Mr. Emmett and Mr. Carey, uh, you may not have been on in the beginning, 
Uh, I unfortunately have a um, prior commitment at seven o'clock, uh, but I will listen in for the first, uh, what do we got, about 15 minutes. I got to jump off at seven o'clock, literally switching from one Zoom to another. Uh, but you will be in the capable hands of our deputy mayor at that point. Um, I apologize. I did not get a chance to see last night's Board of Ed meeting. I had another board meeting uh, simultaneously and I never got a chance to watch on YouTube. Um, but a lot of the questions will probably be repeat of what you presented last night in the um, finance workshop. Our questions for, for the board, and thank you again for the presentations, uh, both the first initial presentation from the board and the follow-up uh, in conjunction with the town manager's pre uh, presentation. Um, I guess what we're looking at is uh, possibly four buckets of funds that the board may have received. Um, one would have been similar to what I was just talking to um, Ms. Barry about the, any kind of Connecticut rescue plan that had come out over the summer uh, from OPM or from the governor's office. Uh, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and then the most recent ARP funds that are coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at those, I guess, want to kind of get a sense of what you guys have received already uh, and where some of those funds have uh, already been either spent or where they're allocated uh, to go. Um, sure, happy to provide that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll start off first and foremost with the, the buckets of money. Um, and we have received funding through the, uh, the ESSER 1 grant. Um, we received a total of $254,759. To date through April of 2021, we've expended $199,159.68. Um, this has gone for staff and student PPE for reopening, outside tent rentals to promote social distancing during the first week of school reopening. Uh, some of those tents have actually returned. Uh, we spent uh, funding on plexi barriers to support uh, reopening. So we have plexiglass barriers for staff we purchased iPads for hybrid and remote learning for our youngest learners. Um, we purchased uh, specific musician masks related to COVID requirements for reopening for our young musicians. Um, we also purchased PPE specifically for nurses. Uh, we purchased HVAC filters to promote better school ventilation, uh, a number of N95 masks for nursing staff, we purchased SEL supplies, social emotional learning supplies for our students. Uh, and we've also included some technology equipment as well and portable radios for school safety. So with ESSER ones at this point in time, we have uh, a balance of $55,599. And we expect this funding to go toward um, the additional uh, PPE that we may need for the remainder of this school year and supplies. Um, we're also looking to finish off remedial tutors to support our students throughout the district with this funding. So with regard to ESSER 2 funding, this was the uh, presentation that was provided to the Weathersfield Board of Education last evening. Uh, the ESSER 2 allocation for the Weathersfield Public Schools is $1,214,993. Um, with this funding, we actually received word from the state that um, the state had incorrectly calculated the figure uh, for us and our actual account number was $1,145,027. The state held harmless all districts that saw that reduction. So the $69,966 that the district was uh, slated to lose has actually been restored. So it is $1,214,993. So so last night at the presentation, we talked about how we would be spending this uh, funding and we're looking for the following uh, positions. We're looking for uh, $489,966 for seven math interventionists to serve students at each school and improve, and improve the scientifically research-based intervention process. Um, right now across the district, we have curriculum specialists that are primarily focused on reading. 
We do not have an emphasis right now on math instruction. Uh, our STAR data, which is our assessment that we utilize to chart student progress, is definitely showing a pretty significant weakness in the area of math. And uh, we definitely see an impact with regard to the pandemic there. Um, we're looking for $80,000 to design, implement, and coordinate a summer program for incoming K-12 that includes credit recovery, transition to kindergarten, uh, transition to grade seven, and transition to high school. Um, this is funding that was originally in the operating budget that has come out, and we are uh, supporting that through the ESSER II funds. We're looking uh, to allocate $60,000 for two family liaisons, one at the elementary level and one at the secondary level to support our families with outside services. This is, these are positions that are beyond the social work um, component as social workers are engaged with providing students with um, specific IEP based services. We're looking to allocate $15,000 for teacher professional development related to social emotional curriculum, mental health and restorative practices. We are looking uh, for $379,000 as an allocation to uh, enter a one-year contract with Effective School Solutions. This will provide clinical mental health support for students and coaching for our staff members. This is going well above and beyond the resources that we currently have within this district. And let me say clearly, as we've seen our students come back to in-person learning, the need is absolutely there. Um, we're looking also for $100,000 allocated to purchase Rethink Ed curriculum. This is software for tier one lessons related to social emotional learning. Um, this has been vetted by our teaching staff, both at the elementary and the secondary level. And uh, this will be implemented across the district. We're looking to allocate $20,000 for additional PPE and supplies related to mental well being and physical safety. And we'll be looking to allocate $71,027 for district-wide smart board replacements. Um, last evening, our tech team uh, expressed that our oldest smart boards in our classrooms date back to 2003. So we're looking to uh, replace some of those most ancient units with uh, up-to-date units. Other funding sources that we've had, we had the state coronavirus funding that came in, uh, that was a total of $214,301. That has been expended. Uh, within that, we have provided to the town, to the physical services department, $34,360.82 for electrostatic sprayers for cleaning buildings. Uh, so we have a Clorox disinfection machine in each of our buildings across the district. Uh, District-wide PPE, uh, CNC janitorial supplies, Alton supply, any industrial supply, uh, EBP supply solutions, uh, CNC janitorial supplies. This is district-wide PPE, uh, sanitary wipes, um, hand sanitizing stations uh, for our students. Also, um, we uh, provided to the town $5,567.40 for elementary touchless bottle filling stations. Um, so some of our uh, old water fountains did not have that capability and we did not want to provide students with an opportunity to touch surfaces. So we replaced uh, several um, old antiquated uh, uh, systems with the new bottle filling system. So um, to all told, um, we provided the physical services over this past year, $83,337.37. Um, other aspects, one of the things that physical services has taken on through our shared services um, operation is furniture. So I do wanna let the council know that with regard to um, furniture and equipment, we utilized our um, cafeteria fund to purchase uh, convertible benches, folding tables, and chairs. This was related to having to reconfigure our um, cafeterias to support students being able to eat while being socially distanced. So we provided uh, $82,256.58 for the benches, tables, and chairs. In addition to that, uh, for physical services, we purchased three scrubbing machines for the floors uh, that was a total of approximately $25,000. A couple of other items moving forward in terms of what's next on the horizon. Um, back in March, when I presented to you, I made mention of the allocation of the American Rescue Plan Act. 
Um, the figure that I provided you for the Board of Education was approximately 2,600,000. Uh, that was based on a letter that I received from uh, Congressman Larson. Uh, as I speak with you this evening, we have still yet to receive the actual allocation of this funding, nor have we received the parameters with which how we may spend it. I will tell you that what we are looking to do as this funding runs through September of 2024, we're looking to front load the ESSER II funds next year and then utilize the American Rescue Plan funds to continue the work that we're doing with the ESSER II allocation. So. We'll provide more specifics as soon as we get the allocation with regard to that funding. Um, Mayor Rell, you made mention of the enrichment uh, grant. Um, we received that last week. Um, at this point, I don't believe that we are eligible for that, given the fact that we received greater than $50,000 of ESSER II funding. I'm gonna verify that for sure with the state. And then last but not least, kind of outside the realm of COVID, just to let everyone know, um, the state did release another round of um, safety and security grant money. Um, we are actually looking to submit a grant for reimbursement for um, the replacement of our NVR system at Weathersfield High School and uh, increasing and replacing the number of cameras that we have across our schools. Um, Again, one of the things we've done this year is with the new NVR, um, back in the past, we had relied heavily upon Honeywell to uh, manage the system. Because of shared services and the uh, you know, expertise of our tech team, now with regard to camera replacement and camera repair, we can do that in-house. We don't have to contract out with Honeywell anymore. The only cameras that we may need to get some help with in terms of installation would be units that are on exterior parts of the building that our tech team can't reach. So. That's the, the general piece in a nutshell. Uh, in addition to that, last evening, everyone um, got together with our finance subcommittee and uh, we had a finance subcommittee meeting uh, and our current budget uh, is favorable at this point in time. We are currently operating under budget. Uh, and again, that's consistent with what we had uh, happen last year with uh, last year's budget as well. So uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you this evening. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Um, I will first ask any questions for you or uh, for Matt on those that are on the Zoom right now. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to jump off onto this other Zoom. I will keep you guys on. And if I get a chance to toggle back and forth, I will. Um, but uh, I appreciate you. Uh, running through all those numbers, I tried my best, even to the 37th cent on the uh, PPE that you got us. So um, I will turn it over to the deputy mayor to run this, and then you know you guys can you know discuss some some things back and forth. And I'm sure that there will be some ongoing conversations with Mike O'Neill and Matt Kazaka. Mm -hmm. So. I appreciate the presentation and um, I look forward to, uh, to talking to uh, the council members and to Mike uh, after this. So thank you very much. So we'll open it up to uh, questions from counselors. Do you have any for Mr. Emmett? Matt, jump in there. Thanks Tom and good to see you this morning as always. Um, Mike, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, my first indication was that some of the ESSER II funding was uh, for, you know, obviously beefing up that transition back to school and, and many positions. Um, as we sort of move, we're going to use those funds. But then I thought, you know, is this like a one-shot deal where we, we sort of beef up a lot of the, whether it's staffing or support systems, right? And then 12 months from now, the ESSER funding is not there and it tails off. But then there was some discussion about, uh, because we have until four four more years, right? Then we're going to sort of use some other funding from the re recovery funds, I think it was Correct. called. Correct. But, uh, but there wasn't much discussion about, okay, like here's where we see our needs for in the next year. My gut from like listening to the way you guys were piecing it together was, we're going to have some social emotional stuff as we sort of transition back. We're going to have some tech issues as we transition back. 
we got to get people caught up because there's yeah, that year was a little dicey. I think we can all admit, mm -hmm. and um, and that that you know that was that first twelve months coming back. But then you know there's going to be as people transition back and becomes more normalized, which I think we're expecting to do. Then like we never talked about how what your what your future those next three years were, and then this is some significant money, right? So if we're anticipating three or four years goes by, is there a tail off? Do you think the town would be then in a position where, okay, like we've seen like a lot of grant positions, the grant money dries up, we think it's nice, but now we've got this ongoing obligation of another 2 million. I'm sure someone like Mary was gonna jump in with something like that. Uh, so we didn't really talk about that long-term, you know, the, the use case was there, but then the transition from year one into this next set of funding and then sort of that longer term, five year, 10 year tail. If you could sort of talk to that, that'd be helpful. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the question. Yeah, I think uh, for us, we're not looking at next year's funding as being one and done. Uh, let me give you an example with regard to uh, summer school. You know, the research tells us that a, a summer school program that is one year and is not sustainable does not have any impact. So we would look to fund this coming summer's summer school with ESSER funds, and then next year's summer school would be out of the Recovery Act funds so that we could sustain it. Um, with regard to the contracted services with ESS, the hope there would be able, that we would be able to extend that for at least two years. Part of the process with that, Matthew, is to make sure that we build the capacity also within our staff to be able to take that and run with it. It's one of the reasons why it's a contracted position. Um, we faced this before. I know, you know, back when you were on council the first time you were on the board, we've had these grant funds come in and then you end up with that cliff. So one of the reasons why we're trying to balance it out with ESSER funding, then followed by the rescue plan funding is we can sustain it for a longer period of time. I think the more challenging positions are going to be those math interventionalists down the road when the money eventually runs out how do we absorb those positions within our budget? Those I see as being a challenge. Again, with the family liaison positions, I think down the road, if they pay off the way we think they're going to pay off, um, you know, that may be something we can explore grant funds to continue to support. Uh, but that's kind of a nutshell of, of where we're at. I want you to be clear that we're not looking at this as being one and done. And we recognize that you know, we're eventually gonna face that cliff down the road. So what does that cliff look like three years from now, four years from now, when the when that second, uh, I forgot what, the recovery funds dry up? Yeah, well, it's going to look at, when you look at it from the perspective of the math interventionalists, we were looking at uh, the, the 489,000. So it's about a half a million dollars for those interventionist positions. I would see eventually that the, the support uh, from ESS, the contractor, I would see that fading out. Um, so that would no longer be a, a concern. As I said, with regard to the um, professional development, the PD that we're doing with regard to um, restorative practices, that's another one of those components where we can't do a one and done. That's got it. And that's really when we look at the need for um, moving staff forward and, and getting them back in, that restorative practice work and the SEL work is going to be important. And with that, again, 15,000 every single year. Well, we'd be able to absorb that either within the budget or we could utilize title uh, funds down the road. So I don't see the, that PD piece being a major concern. Um, certainly the biggest concern for me would be the interventionalists. And so a th I guess it's four years from now, we're looking at maybe a half a million dollar cliff where we can, we'd have to evaluate to see Correct. Uh, you know, what effect these, these people have had in the out, you know, student outcomes, scores, et cetera. Yes. And do you have a will? Do you have a, a a mechanism for measuring the success of these, not just the interventionalists, but even the other programs as well? I mean, this is this is much more than even a half a million dollars worth of intervention, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, in terms of a, a mechanism, certainly the math intervention interventionalists. What I'd look to see is I'd look to see improved math and uh, achievement among our students. Uh, I'd look to see enhanced instruction within classrooms to help kids catch up looking at enhanced instruction to help kids accelerate. Um, with regard to the ESS component, uh, that's going to be based upon each individual family. Um, you know, I will tell you that we are certainly seeing the impact of this pandemic over the past year uh, with the number of students that have uh, mental health needs. 
uh, being at the high school this afternoon, you know, having an administrator come up and say, hey, we, we really need some help. Um, we don't think this is going to be a, a short term effect. We think we're going to be dealing with the effects of this for, for quite some time. You know, you look at it from the perspective of, you know, families and, you know, losing jobs, we've seen it, the increase in homelessness. Um, you know, I think from a perspective of ESS, providing that, that tier three support, the most clinical support, connecting families with mental health services. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of families we've dealt with already that are on waiting lists or that are awaiting placements at a facility. And in the meantime, these kids are left to twist. So having that additional support with the clinical focus, um, I think is gonna be critical. Again, my expectation, Matthew, would be that we would phase that out as we build our capacity um, yeah. moving forward. So um, what are we talking about specifically for the math interventionalist? It's a, it's a big piece of this program. Yes. Um, are you anticipating like we're looking at standardized test scores, whether it's SBAC or SAT or ACT or AP? Like, are we going to be looking at those like, OK, you know, 19 and 20 and 21, we were here. Now 22, 23, 24, we're here. Is that, I mean, the kind of stuff that we can anticipate, you know, for this type of investment, which yes, I, mean, I love investing in our town, don't get me wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the other things we did this year when we're talking math, um, the board was proactive in reallocating current funding uh, to support continuation of our Go Math program. Um, some years back, we adopted the Go Math program and we invested in a six year commitment. That commitment is ending as of this year. The board has already approved funding out of this year's operating budget. So I have all of my materials for Go Math for the next three years. What the math interven interventionists will do along with teachers within the next three years, it will be to assess our math program and look at other alternatives for our math program so that three years out, we will be prepared to either A, continue with Go Math, or we will be selecting another program. But it, it buys us some time and it gives us some additional opportunity for data collection. Okay, I've got two, just two more areas to talk about. The one is, um, we recently, you know, in the last six months approved, I believe it was phase three of right. the, you know, looking at our, uh, K through six system uh, and holistically. Are there any of these funds that can be used or I maybe missed and didn't really anticipate? Are there any of these funds that are being used to advance that sort of holistic approach as we look at a K through six re revamping for lack of a better term? Yeah, good. Again, a good question. We don't have any funding related to long-term projects in any of the ESSER funding. Um, we had relied on the 2% reserve fund. Uh, I do know last year, I think the board total that went back to the 2% reserve fund was about approximately 148,000. Um, this year we requested the uh, funding for phase three. Phase three is in process right now. We're awaiting updated cash flow, and then we'll do an <clears throat> update on the enrollment study. So again, my hope moving forward, when we get to that point where we're talking uh, referendum in the future, we'd be able to utilize the 2% uh, reserve funds to uh, move that forward. So following on that, is there generally, and I'm using really, I'm, you know, I'm giving you some wiggle room here. Is there generally an understanding of what the time frame for that feedback will be analysis and then presentation for the town moving forward? Yeah, this point, now? yeah oh. I, I would say within six months, Matthew, at this point in time, we'll have an update in terms of where we're headed. And then is it, uh, was it considered or should it be considered by the council that you know, as we move forward with that, there's also tons of costs that are, uh, you know, from planning and the rest of it, swing space, right? Should we start be putting away some money so that impact is tempered, uh, you know, with this large, large, large amount of money coming in, but we anticipate what you're talking, what we're talking about is a huge lift for this town, yes. like the high school. So yes. should we be thoughtful and tempering some of that and putting some of this money away to sort of allow us to smooth out that, that glide path? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a possibility. And, you know, you mentioned the idea of swing space. And one of the things that we talked about in terms of our planning is avoiding, you know, having to use portables and really limiting the amount of swing space and utilizing the buildings that we already have in place for that swing space. Um, you know, we learned a lot with regard to the high school renovation, you know, having to phase it and, you know, having to go back for additional funding. I think, you know, the 
process of going through this methodically and thoughtfully where we eliminate the um, interaction of students in with construction. Uh, we have the ability to um, work more efficiently and at a more cost effective rate. Uh, we're trying to come up with a plan that we think meets the best needs of our uh, community. And I agree. I think that uh, the, the reality here is this is going to be a definite big lift, um, but it's one I think is definitely worth taking, um, you know, given our phase one data, which clearly showed where we were looking for, you know, 30, 31.9 million in repairs. And yeah. I know with capital improvements, Sally's come forward and, you know, made a lot of requests with regard to capital improvement. So I'd certainly like to see this move forward. Um, obviously, I understand that the, you know, uh, budget situation has been difficult. I think, you know, we're at or beyond now the peak of the debt service with regard to the high school. So, you know, and I appreciated the council support in moving forward with phase three. So was it taken into consideration, you know, moving past phase three in this pot of money for a set aside, or was that not put it into consideration? Or was it taken into consideration and then say, you know, it's way down at the bottom. It's, you know, of all these things, this is at the bottom. Yeah at, this, that yeah. Would yeah, at this point in time, Matthew, we have not included, you know, with the ESSER funding, our focus has been on students, uh, social emotional health, and really our three uh, priorities. It's achievement, it's empathy, and it's equity. Looking at those three. So if you, if, if after we leave this conversation, you and obviously Chairman Kerry and the board think about if, they, if it's true that they, you guys want to move forward with this phase three, if, a por if under reconsideration that a portion of these funds should be set aside for all the various items that are going to be brought forward. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. I yeah, can't well, answer right now. I get okay. it. But. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd certainly like the opportunity to see where, you know, phase three takes us. Um, you know, I'd also say that with last year's funding that was returned to the town, plus this year's budget, you know, we're currently under budget. I would wonder if some of this year's budget uh, surplus might go into the 2% reserve to cover the cost of a referendum or phase four. So certainly it might be, but obviously we're going to be, we've got all, there's all these considerations. So we want to hear what you have to say as far as what your planning is. You talked about six months, that's in the next fiscal year, right? You mm -hmm. know I mean? We're, we're there. What type of lift are we talking about? What type of preliminary <laughs> documents do we need to be created? We've got a referendum and bond council and all that stuff. And, you know, we're working on this together. So yeah. If you could take that in consideration and maybe get back to us with your thoughts, I'd be very interested as we plan this budget and this large right. amount of money coming in appropriately. Sure. The last thing I want to talk to you about is we had, um, and it's related to that, but we had uh, Kathy Bagley in from Park and Rec's Recreation. We obviously have Keisha Farm, which was somewhat recently purchased now. And there wasn't much consideration or discussion between the Board of Education and Park and Rec's, it seemed, about when we're talking about re- formatting the footprint of our education system, how that is going to play hand in hand with recreation, right? Fields and so forth and so on. So have, have you considered as you start to move forward with the, you know, the use of the, the land and the buildings of the schools, have you, have you had conversations about the future with park and recreations and, and you know, how they're using that land in schools, soccer fields, baseball fields, basketball courts, swimming pools, right? The whole nine yards. Yeah, at this point, I'm not quite certain what Keisha Farm was slated to be used for. Um, what we did within phase two is we did a test fit on the current uh, baseball field over on the corner and looked at a two-story building. Uh, and we fit it outside of the Keisha Farm property because at the time, the town was in the process of purchasing it. So again, in terms of whether or not there would be discussion around, do we uh, do a test fit on the Keisha Farm property? Do we make an adjustment um, with regard to including where the barn is currently? Um, we had not done that. Um, that's certainly something we could look at with our consultants. Um, I'm not sure at this point in time, I know there was a meeting with regard to what to do with Keisha Farm. Has it been determined that it's going to be fields at this point? Yeah, and we don't have to solve that right now, but what I'm talking about is there's footprints that you guys, uh, the Board of Education has. Like if you were to take Hamner School, for example, there's a baseball field next to Hamner School. So if you're going to build either a newer Hamner School or move Hamner School or use that as swing space, now we're down a baseball field. Or if it took that baseball field, is a baseball field or a soccer field or are there going to now be two fields that are now in the place of where the old Hamner was, right? Right. So it's that type of planning with the sports leagues, with park and recs uh, that didn't necessarily appear to be happening. And with, 
with the, the amount of sort of construction and, and improvement that we're looking at with the town, like that, that should be talked about. And I was a little concerned about the disconnect there. So I'm letting you know, it seemed to be a little disconnect and I'm hopeful that you guys can talk <laughs> to, to work that out, especially with the, the various um, sports organizations. That's all. Thank you. Thanks for the time. You're welcome. That's it, Matt, you're done? Done. Does anybody else have any budget related questions? Councillor Pelletier. Hi, um, I, I did get a chance to watch your, um, the meeting last night that you had with the presentation of the ESSER two funds. And um, I thought, you know, it was interesting. You found a way to spend every penny <laughs> um, and some things are great. I think the math interventionalists like that would be useful, obviously. Um, but I was wondering if you considered looking into your proposed budget and for items that you could um, that you could use the that ESSER money on that instead of asking the taxpayers to pay for it. I know there's you know technology included in your proposed budget. Um, you know maybe some social emotional learning stuff included in that budget and just you know ways to um use that money in that way what did you consider that instead of looking for all you know new programs and new things to spend the money on yeah actually uh miss pellet here with regard to our increase in the proposed operating budget um the only things that are in there are two administrative positions uh, and I believe there was also funding for our participation in the correct teacher residency program. Um, what we did up front was we originally had the summer school program in the budget and we have uh, shed that. So that's no longer in the budget. Um, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're amenable to looking at any way we can to make this budget work. Um, you know, I will say also, and Matt, I'd like to, you know, have you weigh in on this as well. In terms of the, the budget increase for the operating budget next year, what percentage of it? Is it all, is it fixed cost or is it like uh, flexible cost? Can you weigh in on that, Matt Kazarka? Sure. Within the town council presentation that was about a month ago, we had a slide in there that was a graph detailing the um, dollar amount change by object code. And looking at salary and benefits, which are all contractual obligations, we were at $1.9 million versus the total budget request of 1.5. So that was 125% of the total request. If we back out those two new administrative positions, we're still at 1.66 million, which is 108% of the overall budget request. And that's not even factoring other um, fixed costs when you're looking at transportation and tuition. We were fortunate in December and January to project a decrease in special ed tuition and transportation, but we know that's already changing in this month and going through the summer that while it is a decrease in our proposed budget, we could have several outplacements by the time we hit August and September and that number could flip dramatically. Um, I I have another question about the um, the the amount that you are um, under budget it about seven hundred and change um, is that what's projected to be um, left over at the end of the school year or just correct seven hundred six thousand is the projection through the end of June okay. And um, just to go back quickly about the um, the ESSER funds and, you know, maybe finding some things that are in the proposed budget, you could spend it on. I, it, it's sort of, I, you know, I did look over the guidelines and it seems like it's pretty flexible um, for what you could spend the money on. And it seems to me there's even, a, you know, you could call it a catch-all provision at the end that says it could be used on you know other activities necessary to maintain the operation of and continuity of services in local educational agencies and continuing to employ existing staff of the educational agency. So I just, you know, I 
I would have liked to see some of it offset um, something in the budget, even the um, the correct teacher residency program, I think, could um, be paid for out of ESSER funds from my reading of the guidelines. So um, I don't know. I just think that might be something you want to consider. Um, and one other thing, um, you mentioned that you reimbursed or paid physical services for some of the expenses um, relating to like uh, the cleaning or equipment and stuff relating to uh, getting the schools um, ready for reopening and all that. Mm -hmm. um, is that, is there, which I, I you know, I, I had brought that up to, um, I don't remember if it was Mike O'Neill or to Sally. And I think, you know, I, have you reimbursed them just for specific things that you want to purchase from them? Or what about the, um, like, the work that say the town staff is doing to do the deep cleaning, to do improve the ventilation of the schools and that sort of thing, um, like the work, I guess, as opposed to um, goods like sanitizer or you know floor cleaning machines. Um, has there been any reimbursement for like services like the ventilation improvements and? Um, uh, you know, the deep cleanings that they've been doing every Wednesday, that sort of thing? Yeah, not not specific reimbursement. And again, these weren't reimbursements. The town didn't spend this. These were requests from the town uh, to purchase these items. Um, labor was not included as any type of payment. Um, it was related to supplies. So for the deep clean that you mentioned for Wednesdays, those electrostatic sprayers, that was what was purchased to allow them to be able to do that that cleaning. So, yeah. But in terms of labor, no, there was no no coverage of labor. It was all materials and supplies. Okay. And one other thing with the HVAC um, filters, it's interesting because, um, I like Sally Katz talked about the HVAC filters. How she had to purchase more of those, mm -hmm. and then you're saying you've also been purchasing them. Yeah. So maybe it's just it's just interesting. I. I don't know if, I mean, I know they've been having to uh, be replaced more frequently and that's why Sally said the cost of those have gone up, but then yeah. you're also buying them. So I just wonder, yeah. like, it just seems a little odd, but that's good. They're being changed frequently. Well, and again, in many of these uh, schools, like at Hammer, for example, you have individual units. So it's not just one filter for an entire system. They have to go into each individual classroom, take the heatilator unit out and um, replace them that way. So yeah, there are a ton of them that have to be replaced. Thanks. You're welcome. Wouldn't the, uh, wouldn't the labor component be something that we could use uh, grant money for? I mean, they're certainly spending a lot of time replacing filters and extra cleaning of the schools. And are we saying that none of that None of those costs can be um, reimbursed, if you will, through those funds. Matt, you want to take that one? Well, it was never requested via Paul Schoening. Uh, Paul would always come to the board when it was related to PPE and specific vendor purchases. And that's where we came up with the 83000 from the Coronavirus Relief Fund as well as the over $100,000 from the cafeteria fund for the tables and chairs and scrubbers. Okay. Councilor Biggs. Good evening. Uh, hello, Matt and Michael. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, my question, is, as it pertains to the budget and the positions, um, you spoke before, not tonight, but before our last meeting about a uh, special ed supervisor and the two administration positions. Um, as far as the special ed supervisor, would that, and, and you're the professionals, and so I'm just trying to get your ideas on this. Um, would that be more impactful than having an actual teacher to help take off the workload of the other teachers in the special ed, as well as those administrative positions? 
Yeah, the, the special education supervisor position is an administrative position. So it must contain an 092 certificate. And that individual is charged with administering uh, IEPs at, at meetings. So it is a difference between special ed teacher and administrator. We have two right now. And the two take care of over 500 students uh, who receive special ed services or Section 504 services in district. They're also responsible for students who attend magnet schools or out of district placements that um, have IEPs or 504 plans as well. So this individual would be able to take some of the load off our current two and allow our current two, specifically our current special ed supervisor who also holds a board certified behavior analyst license to rather than attending meetings and administering IEPs, she can focus on supporting teachers in classrooms and providing that behavioral support. So we see that um, Ryan is something very, very important. It's something that we've asked for in the past. Um, as you may know, we've uh, built a lot of programs in house to keep our kids in district as opposed to having to send them out at high cost to the taxpayer with regard to tuition and uh, transportation. So, you know, the one thing we've asked for over the past several years is an increase in the number of administrators. And that's the one thing we haven't gotten. We've gotten additional special ed teachers. We've reallocated tuition dollars for paras and for social work support, but administration is where we're lacking. And then if I could build on your question with regard to the other administrative position, just to remind council that that instructional supervisor for grade seven through 12, at one point in time, we had two. Uh, we had a instructional supervisor for um, two different curricular areas and both of those positions were cut um, during past budget reductions and they were cut through attrition. So this would be for that curriculum position, it's restoring one of the positions that we lost. Got it, thank you very much for that explanation. I just wanted to make sure that it was a position that would help take the workload off the teachers who seem to be impacted the most right now. So thank you for explaining Absolutely. that. Thank you, sir. Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, Matt and Michael, thank you for all those answers. Um, kind of piggybacking off of what Councillor Pelletier was uh, referring to um, with the ESSER 1, ESSER 2 funds. Um, so we kind of understand now, obviously, with the actions last night, that money is, is kind of is allocated and it's obviously going to very worthy causes. Um, now switching gears over to the kind of the ARP funds, you know, we are in a position now where as a council, we have about you know, two, two weeks or so to craft and, and vote on, on a budget for next year. Um, yeah. And just your, this is more of an opinion, I suppose, is that, you know, should, I, I assume that we shouldn't even consider, because you, you guys don't have guidelines or any parameters from the federal government on how you can even spend these dollars. So as a council, who, you know, we're obviously interested in where the money is going and we have to make sure that we're not duplicating payments and we want to make sure this is, you know, this is taxpayer money, make sure it's all going in the proper space. Um, how should we approach that? Just almost, should we even acknowledge it at all in, in this, uh, the next two weeks as we deliberate this? Yeah, Kevin, I think that's a very good question. And I think, you know, right now, without having the actual allocation and the parameters under which we can spend it, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to apply the rescue plan into next year's budget. And that's one of the reasons why, with regard to the ESSER funding, that's a grant that's already been allocated. Uh, we completed our needs assessment, submitted that to the state along with the grant application. Um, that one is pretty well set in terms of, you know, what we're looking to get out of it. Right now with the, um, you know, Rescue Plan Act, we just, we don't have that. We're taking it from a perspective of, as, as Matthew had talked about earlier with that cliff, being able to extend the services and the supports that we're requesting within the ESSER funds out over the course of time so that we do not have that cliff where we're trying to either come to the council to say, hey, we need more money to support these positions, be able to you know, gather up our data, ensure that they're effective, and then be able to phase them out down the road. So um, again, I, I wanna be clear with you all, you know, we wanna work collaboratively with you, um, but 
from our perspective, we're looking at it from, you know, allocating this funding to make sure we're supporting classroom uh, students and, and teachers first and foremost. But again, as the flexibility allows, we'll certainly, uh, we'll be at the table with you. No, I appreciate that. It's um, obviously with the amount of money that the board and the town is getting, it's, it's, it's a staggering amount. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're using it wisely. It's just the timing is extremely unfortunate and very frustrating as we're, we're coming, you know, you know the, the nine members of the council, there's nothing more that we'd like to do is to, you know, show some, uh, show taxpayers in the town that we're obviously using it very wisely. But without parameters, we're, we're kind of flying blind right now. Um, and switching gears quickly, I'm sorry, I'll be brief, is um, regarding this year's budget, uh, uh, Mr. Gazaka was kind enough to kind of mention regarding the, the contractual obligations you do have for this year that are baked into your increase, um, which actually, the, Matt, if you could just quickly talk again quickly about how the contractual obligations are actually higher than what you what the proposed increase is is that correct you had to re reduce in other um in other parts of your budget to get to that number yeah that's correct kevin we had salary and benefits were about 1.9 million for next year our total budget request is about 1.5 so that's 125 percent and if we back out those two administrative positions it's 1.66 about 108 percent and I mentioned we were fortunate that when we did our budget projection in December into January, we were anticipating uh, fewer costs related to special education, tuition, and transportation. So we had a reduction of about $300,000 to offset those contractual obligations and increases. Unfortunately, we're seeing a few additional students being outplaced as we got through the second half of the 2021 school year. And we can't anticipate what's going to happen over the summer into August and September. So while we're going to remain with that $300,000 reduction in the 21-22 budget, that may not be uh, appropriate once we get into the next school year. So I'll, I'll, I'll steal some of the deputy mayor's thunder here and I'll ask the, the, the devil's advocate question of that. If we asked you to come in at a zero, um, you know, that's, you know, one point, you know, basically cut asking you to cut 1.66 from your operating budget. What does that look like? Yeah, we have not gone through those scenarios, but I would have to say that it's devastating. There's only so much we can reduce with discretionary spending related to supplies and technology licenses and softwares. With one and a half million dollars, you will get into staff. Yeah, I understood. And then obviously, and then at that point, it really kind of makes the any supplemental funds you get from the state or the federal government kind of move. Right. It would it would negate a lot of the programs we're attempting to institute, especially when it relates to student SEL. Got it. And how um, and this is my last question, I apologize, is the uh, minimum, minimum budget requirement, how does that, uh, I mean, how does that work in terms of all you have all these different pay sources now coming in uh, between the municipal, the state and the federal government? Um, how does that all marry together in order to give you that, that number for the MBR? Uh, that's a good question. We have not received any guidance on how to factor in SR1, SR2, any of the other funding into the MBR calculation. My understanding is that it still applies for the 2021 year. Beyond that, I don't know what the, what the details will be. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Uh, Matt, could you expand on that a little bit with the uh, MBR? So you're saying that the ESSER funds that you've already used or are planning on using in this year add to the MBR number, is that correct? No, I, I don't believe that's the case, but like I said, I haven't heard any guidance if that is going to be a factor beyond the 2021 fiscal year. Okay. Nothing's come from the state level at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to kind of, along the same lines as uh, Councillor Hill, and it's just disheartening that you know, we're, 
we're getting this $7.6 million worth of money coming into the town, 5 million of which is for schools, for education. And we can't do anything to utilize those funds to reduce the impact on the, on the residents, you know, due to this pandemic. And I thought that was like the basic intent of the funds was to help people when we've been beaten down over the last year, people are out of work and all kinds of situations going on with uh, food issues and, you know, daycare issues, all kinds of things. And uh, I'm just thinking that, you know, there's enough smart people on this meeting tonight that we could figure out a way to utilize some of those funds to, to reduce our uh, tax burden on residents. Not, not getting a good feeling. So, I don't know if anybody has any comments about that. I have a comment about that. I, I, you know, I, I think we can do things. I think that, you know, with all due respect, I think that, you know, it seems like you'd rather spend the money on these other programs. Of course, you would rather use the millions of dollars to find, you know, these new exciting programs that, you know, you want to focus on empathy and equity and achievement. And I mean, I think we all agree that, you know, kids go to school to learn and they've really taken a hit this year because the school's only been open, you know, in a hybrid model. So the math sports have gone down and now you have to fix the problem that was created by keeping the schools, you know, half closed by, you know, hiring the math, the math experts, who I actually think of all the, of all the, you know, proposed ways to spend the money, that's probably makes the most sense. It'll have the biggest impact. Uh, um, but I think that the money can be spent to, um, on things that are included in your operating budget. So, to say, you know, well, what if we, you know, reduced it? Oh, well, then we'd have to just start laying off staff. Well, I already read you the catch-all provision in the SR2 guidelines. It says that the SR2 money can be used to maintain the operation and continuity of services and to continue to employ existing staff. So why would you have to lay off the staff? You're getting millions of dollars. And to say that you can't use the, that you can't use that money because we don't have you know, explicit guidelines. From what I understand, the uh, American Rescue Plan funds are gonna be even more flexible than the ESSER funds. Now, I know we don't have the guidelines and we can't count on that, but it seems the ESSER guidelines are, are pretty expansive and I think they're choosing to read them in a very narrow way because you would like to spend the money on other things. I would like to see, you know, the taxpayers of the town be respected and, um, to try to do what we can and work together to make sure that um, you know that we can get there and use the federal funds wisely. Anybody else have a comment, Councillor Forrest? Thanks, Deputy. Um, the The response you gave related to the MBR was, "We don't know." but we, we do know what the rules are for MBR. And I don't think the law has changed. So maybe there's some guidance or some assumptions that you need that need to be made as far as how something is allocated. But if you could get back to us about what you anticipate or what counsel, maybe your legal counsel anticipates as the use and the calculations for MBR, um, that would be extremely helpful. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not exactly satisfied with like we don't know. We have to we have to know because we have to set a responsible budget. Um, so, is it possible for you to get us the best guidance that you have as far as the relation to MBR? Whether even if you have to you know use a lawyer to figure it out or other <laughs> or other. Yeah, that would yeah, come yeah. from the state. Yep. I mean, right, but we know. I mean, we know what MBR is. We've been using this for you know years and years and years. So, um, 
if you don't, if you can get guidance, the guidance either from the state or the best guess at what the guidance will be and let us know, that would be extremely helpful. So we craft a legal budget, I guess you might say. That's a, is that doable, uh, Ms. Rama? It is, sir. All right, great. Thanks. Appreciate that. Anyone else want to speak? I'm not missing anybody. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Emmett and Matt Kozaka and the rest of the Board of Ed members for coming out tonight and giving us your best shot at it. And with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Take care, guys. Great job. Gary, are we going to move on to uh, Chris or um, Mike O'Neill? I think uh, we are going to move on to Chris uh, Monroe, which would include Mike O'Neill because it is part of the budget uh, process for Board of Ed. It also includes uh, the town, of course, as well, but timeliness uh, being what it is since we just discussed. Uh, Board of Ed, it, it fits in with Board of Ed. And good evening, Chris. I don't know if you've met all of the council at this point. I've lost track. <clears throat> but, good evening, um, everybody. Uh, a, a handful, yes, but uh, it's good to see everybody. So, <clears throat> bad timing. Um, and so, and Mike, I think Mike O'Neill is on as well um, by just kind of a quick background as, and I'll let Chris or Mike even um, uh, include more, but um, as part of cost saving initiatives. Um, and I think they probably started two years ago when we first started shopping for uh, seeing what we could do in terms of insurance and saving some of our costs related to health care or health insurance. Um, Chris Monroe at USI had done, done some very painstaking work to see where there could be cost savings compared uh, multiple uh, vendors. Um, and then at the time we came up with a prescription savings program, RX Scripps uh, savings opportunity um, that did not work in the way we had hoped uh, when all was said and done. Um, there were a number of issues with the existing vendor. Um, so Chris and Mike uh, not uh, standing for um, missing an opportunity to find creative ways to save money created their newest and went off on their newest adventure. And then I'll stop talking and let you guys correct everything that I said that was incorrect and uh, fill in the details. Um, again, I, uh, I wanna thank everybody for giving me an opportunity to present, um, to pick up on uh, Gary's comments. Um, this project, if you will, uh, goes back to January of 2020. And at that point in time, our focus was to explore the viability of what is called a pharmacy carve out. And what that would entail uh, would be essentially taking our pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy component of our plan and pulling it from Blue Cross and looking to partner direct with what is called a PBM. And a PBM is a pharmacy benefit manager who in essence is the back room, if you will, when it comes to uh, a carrier-based pharmacy program. So there is a, a lot of savings that could potentially emerge from that type of an approach. And we did um, begin that exercise in 2020 and we're lined up pretty well to move towards a direct relationship with Express Scripts. Um, at the last minute, um, Anthem had invoked uh, some criteria uh, that prevented us from pursuing the carve out. Um, what we decided to do as January rolled into the summer, rolled into the fall, rolled into early 2021, um, was to do a full marketing of our plan um, where we would pick up where we left off on the pharmacy side. But what we'd also do is a full marketing on the medical component of the plan as well. Um, through that exercise, we pulled in uh, bids from uh, traditional carriers like Cigna and Connecticut, Aetna, United Healthcare, and obviously uh, our incumbent Blue Cross. Um, we also, on the pharmacy side, looked at what is called the big three, if you will, which would be bids from CVS Caremark, Express Scripts, 
and Optum RX. Um, that exercise yielded a recommendation from myself that we pursue the following two initiatives. Um, we end our medical administrative relationship with Blue Cross and appoint Cigna as our new vendor for July 1st. On the pharmacy side, I made an equal recommendation that we end our relationship with Blue Cross and partner up with a firm called RX Benefits. That is in essence a consortium um, where we would place the pharmacy business through RX Benefits uh, on a direct feed to Express Scripts. So that was the recommendation that came out of this analysis. It's important to note kind of what the decision points were. Um, obviously, finances uh, drove the decision in large measure, but it was also based upon what I would call uh, member-facing decisions as well. Um, as you folks know, all of our employees, for the most part, are uh, aligned with a collective bargaining unit. So we had to obviously replicate the current benefit levels in place through Blue Cross. Um, we've done that with a commitment from Cigna on the medical that any benefit that is in place today would be replicated. Um, any issue that they ran across through the implementation process where they found that a benefit couldn't be matched, they would put forth an alternative that reflected a better benefit if for whatever reason their system couldn't accommodate the one we have today. Um, what we also looked at from a member standpoint was network compatibility. Um, Cigna would not work if it resulted in our employees having access to a provider panel that was diminished over what we had today. Um, in order to validate the Cigna network, um, we secured some information that spoke to the number of providers that our people were seeing through Blue Cross and essentially Cigna was able to come to the table with a 97% network match. So that is not disruptive. So we felt we were able to clear that hurdle. Um, we felt based upon some commitments from a customer service standpoint that uh, we had in Cigna a better entity moving forward than what we have in Blue Cross. And on the pharmacy side, we did the same thing. We made sure that formulary to formulary, there was no disruption. We made sure from a repricing standpoint, we were yielding uh, the savings that we expected to get. Uh, pharmacy was a little bit easier, folks, because we had just done this exercise last year. Um, so cumulatively, we felt we had checked all the boxes needed to make a recommendation to move forward. Um, we've started to engage our unions through a number of town hall meetings to bring them into the loop. And we're actually at a point now where we're just trying to do those final dot the I's, cross the T, um, put it in front of you folks for your uh, vetting. And then if we're successful there, then the hope is to be able to move forward with a July 1 implementation. Um, I have some exhibits that I'd like to show, but before I get into the exhibits, I know I've talked a lot. Um, let me open it up to the floor for questions you might have for me based upon what I've touched upon. Anybody? I just have one, uh, Chris, just more of a curiosity factor. Um, how big is the pharmaceutical component to the entire policy? Is it significant? Or? Yeah, so we, you know, our, our claim yield is around $10 million a year, nine to 10 million. Um, pharmacy is about two and a half million of that. So Tom, you're looking at, you know, that 23 to 27% yeah. range. So uh, yeah, it's a big piece of the overall pie, um, okay. no doubt. Thanks. I don't see anybody else raising their hand. So if you wanna share your yeah. screen, here you have to give them permission or. Yeah, I got it right here. And I apologize in advance. Um, I am going to be putting up some of the financial exhibits. And obviously there's a lot of information compressed into a 
very small exhibit, but a um, lot of moving pieces in terms of um, what you see before you. Um, I am a big believer in being able to validate out all areas of where we're spending money from a fixed cost standpoint and what each carrier's response was to that fixed cost component. Um, as I mentioned before, we pulled in bids from a number of carriers. Um, we had our traditionals in the Aetna's, Cigna's, Anthem's, um, United Healthcare's, but we also pulled in a nice regional player uh, in the form of Connecticut. Um, there's really three areas that comprise the fixed cost component of our 10, $11 million cost basis. Um, obviously we have our administrative fees that we pay to Blue Cross on an annual basis. When you look at the dollar value of those administrative fees, they roll up to about $390,000 currently. And we saw that staying in that $370,000, $375,000 range with uh, Anthem. Um, we got off to a good start when you look at some of the other carriers who are coming in with a savings yield of about $100,000. So when you look at kind of apples to apples, the level of services that we have today, coupled with what we would get under any of these vendors, um, we were pleased that a few of the vendors were coming in with a nice savings right off the bat. Um, everything we're looking at, folks, is not based upon a one-year deal. Um, this is a three-year fee commitment from the players that emerged as the finalist. So in terms of the $100,000, in our mind, that was a $300,000 pickup because that's $100,000 each and every year for the next three years. So again, it was a good starting point in terms of um, where we situated ourselves on the fixed cost side. Um, second thing that we always look at is stop loss. Um, our stop loss coverage is placed through a captive. And what we found is that the captive um, yielded the best result when measured against most of our other carriers. Um, some of the traditional carriers like Cigna, Aetna, United, um, they felt that they couldn't get there from a pricing standpoint and were comfortable with our ability to maintain our captive relationship um, with uh, uh, CT Prime and would be more than willing to pick up all other pieces and letting the stop loss go. The only real push from a stop loss standpoint was from Anthem, where they floated a rate of $77. Um, there is some concern relative to the viability of that rate. Um, there was no guarantee from Anthem as to where that rate would go in the second year. Um, the stop loss market could be pretty punishing. When you look at the average estimated stop loss increase annually, you know, you're not looking at a two or 3% increase. Um, general expected increases in the stop loss market on the low end are 15%, and you can see them as high as 30 or 40%. So there was some real concern in terms of Anthem's ability to hold that $77 rate. Um, we had challenged them on what the rate basis was when they had the stop loss years ago. And years ago, we were paying over $100 through them. And we, were, we challenged them on, hey, our demographics haven't changed. If anything, they've aged. Our claim experience, if anything, has gone up. How can you um, give us some confirmation that this 77 doesn't become 107 this time next year? And they couldn't give us that. Um, the reason we kind of focus more on keeping the relationship in place through the captive um, we've been with them for uh, almost six years now. When we look at the average rate of increase through the captive, it averages about 9% annually um, versus a marketplace expectation of, again, that 15 to 25% range. So um, there was more security in terms of what we felt the captive has delivered. And my recommendation was to maintain that captive relationship, even though the rate basis is higher than what Anthem had floated um, as a first year offer. Hey, Chris, can I jump in just quickly? Yep. I just want um, to make sure the, the counselors know that CT Prime is a, it's a, you know, it's a municipal pool. It's an interlocal uh, risk pool. 
um, that the town is a member of, the town is an owner uh, with 10 other towns and or boards of education. So it's something we, so we have, we have equity in, in the, the uh, captive. And, uh, you know, we've been, the captive has been a real market disruptor um, primarily for Anthem. And, you know, uh, speaking as a, you know, I'm a member of the board of CT Prime, um, you know, so speaking as the, as the town's representative to that pool, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's, uh, I don't mind saying that that $77 that, that they're proposing is just predatory um, because we've seen it over the last five years um, with CT Prime, um, you know, that Anthem has, has been trying to, to drive the, the uh, captive out of business. The third thing and the one that is the toughest to validate is on the RX rebate piece. Um, when you look at drug manufacturers, anytime or in most instances, whenever a member generates or picks up a brand name prescription, in many instances, the manufacturer will issue a rebate. Um, our arrangement with Anthem is based upon us getting 100% of those rebates. And if you look at what we have received in the, or what we're expected to receive in the current year, it's about $400,000. Now what Anthem is saying through the bid process is we think that the rebate is gonna go from 400, they originally said 750. And our challenge to Anthem was, well, if we're getting 100% of the rebates now, and you're telling us we're getting 100% of the rebates in the new year, um, how can our rebates jump up by 85%? And they came back and said, well, you know, you're right. It's not 750. It's going to actually be uh, 640. And our comment was, well, same question. You know, how can 100% currently and 100% on a go forward basis when our drug mix doesn't change? Our drug mix doesn't change at all. Um, how can we get that type of a savings yield from a rebate standpoint? and they weren't ever able to really give us an answer. You know, what I had shared with the town and the board is this is just an attempt to try to look competitive. At the end of the day, I don't have, see any evidence that would support a rebate yield under Anthem of $640,000. Now I had to post it because that's the number they issued, but my counsel to the town is um, that number will not materialize. When I look at our drug history over the last couple of years, um, we're able to get data that allows us to isolate um, generics versus brand. Um, when we isolate those brand, we can drill down into brand name drugs that are dispensed at all of the various rebate channels. And any which way you look at it, the ability for Anthem to drive 640 um, is dubious at best. Um, we feel through the partnership with Express Scripts, that the rebate yield will be 781. That's based upon 100% of the rebate. Um, that obviously is gonna beg the question, well, how can Anthem give us 100% of the rebate? Express scripts on a direct basis give us 100% of the rebate and the yield is so much larger. Um, the pharmacy side of the ledger is kind of the area that is lacking in transparency. Um, it's somewhat murky in terms of what they call pharmacy definitions. Um, Anthem will make the accurate statement that you are getting 100% of the rebates. But what Anthem also gets from drug manufacturers is payments that they uh, title marketing reimbursement, advertising support. Folks, that's a rebate. Um, they don't call it a rebate. And by not calling it a rebate, they don't have to share it with us. When you look at our arrangement with Express Scripts, we have a more Weathersfield friendly definition of what's a rebate. And you also have fewer exclusions when it comes to what's considered a non-rebatable drug. So the ability to kind of validate that 71, 781 was based enti entirely on our own experience and the ability to look at that experience, look at the definitions, and have more of an analytical support behind where the 781 comes from. So that allowed us to look at Express Scripts as we did last year as a more viable player 
relative to what we have through Anthem. What's not on this exhibit is we also had Express Scripts reprice the 22,000 claims, that $2.5, $2.7 million spend. And we essentially had them run it through their pricing model. We had it, them apply their guaranteed AWP discounts and the evidence supported around $110,000 savings yield on the claim side, which is not in this forecast. So the combination of more transparency, more user-friendly definitions of rebates, fewer exclusions on what's considered a rebatable drug, um, the combination of, of those things yielded the big increase in rebate share, and obviously on the client claim side, additional savings uh, from a newer AWP model than what we have today. So when you take all of these components, folks, and you roll it on up, you have a first year savings from Anthem on an exclusive basis. But again, it's dubious. That 385,000 is driven by, in my estimation, 200,000 in rebate savings that won't materialize. Um, you have the others that represent hard and true savings, okay? Um, a couple other things before I open the floor up to questions. Um, last year, it would have been difficult to leave Anthem. Um, no carrier is going to let you leave without paying, in essence, what's called an exit fee. Um, when we end a relationship with a carrier and you move on to another, um, claims that were incurred prior to that termination are still going to be submitted for processing. Um, so if we were to leave Anthem on July 1, member claims incurred prior will still be submitted in August, September, October, November for processing. The old exit fee structure that we had with Anthem resulted in us having to pay 20% um, of all runouts. And that's a claim that comes in after the fact. Runouts generally tie to um, about one month's worth of claims. And our claim yield monthly is around 800, 900,000. So we were looking at an exit fee last year of about 160 to 180,000 um, because of the uh, work that we did on the pharmacy side, because of Anthem being an obstructionist. I guess the one good thing that came out of that last year is we were able to renegotiate the exit fee down to kind of more of a flat dollar amount. So we'll still pay that $50,000 to get out from under that ar arrangement, but it's certainly much better than what we would have paid had we exited years ago. That $50,000, folks, is baked in as a line item cost. So we are capturing all the moving pieces when it comes to um, what are we paying today? What will we pay under these new arrangements? And even in what we pay under the new arrangements, are we making sure we quantify all of our costs, even our exit fee under Anthem? Um, so I think you know, we're there as far as what we captured on, on, on a total fixed cost basis. Um, let me let you absorb the uh, document and then share with me any questions that you have. If uh, anybody has any questions, just jump in because I can't see everyone. Um, because of the fact that all these arrangements are structured over a three-year basis, um, we'd be selling ourselves short if you looked at just the first year impact. What we wanted to do was look at what's the impact to the town and the board over a three year period. And in modeling that out, we looked at, all right, what would we pay if we stayed with Anthem? And then what, what would we pay if we went to the recommended vendors in Cigna and Express Scripts? And what we wanted to do was look at the low, moderate and a high estimate. And from a low cost estimate, we were looking at around $460,000 in fixed cost savings. This does not include that additional 
hundred, hundred and ten thousand dollar savings on the claim side under the pharmacy do the repricing. We kind of added that in in our moderate estimate. And you can see how the 450 jumps up to 780. What we then did on the high estimate is say to ourselves, okay, you know, I don't think those anthem rebates are going to materialize. Let's make an adjustment for that. The goal of this is just to test the assumptions, to look at best case, worst case, high end case. And I think all the evidence kind of more tilts towards the moderate to the high estimate. So my counsel to the town was, okay, we have a vendor who we've struggled with customer service wise over the last year. We've got a vendor who is very much an obstructionist who stood in our way when it came to driving savings last year on the pharmacy side. And we've got a marketing effort this year that is going to drive what we think over three years will be more in that 750 to 850, $900,000 range. All right. Um, so this is what kind of really led me to say, this is a very viable option from a financial standpoint. When you throw in some of the other work that we're doing relative to the member facing issues, it becomes added security that we have two very viable players uh, in Cigna on the medical and Express Scripts on the pharmacy side. Um, last comment I'd make on this folks, this doesn't mean we are done in our Anthem relationship. We're still gonna maintain a relationship with Anthem uh, in two manners. Um, Anthem still will be the dental carrier for all town and board employees. Um, Anthem will still be the provider for our over 65 retirees. Um, that's a group of about 180 people. Um, they have Medicare as their primary payer and Anthem serves as the secondary payer. Um, we just felt it was too much of an effort to uh, pull them along with what's going on with the active employees. We felt that we were better served to migrate the actives, and then look next year at the viability of migrating the retirees. If the evidence suggests that that's a viable option, we'll pursue it. If the evidence suggests no, then we'll continue to keep that under the Anthem umbrella. Does Anthem maintain the same pricing structure for that much smaller pool of retirees? They, they would, they would. They would. Um, it's self-insured, Tom. So, you know, when you look at the three components of that over 65 plan, um, one component is based upon us paying a conventional rate and that rate's filed with the state and they couldn't change it even if they wanted to. That's the other self-insured, right, what's that? It's, it's fully insured. Fully insured, fully insured. The other, the only self-insured component is on the major med piece and that's kind of claim flow. Um, so there's not a whole lot they can do there. Yeah, so we don't expose ourselves to, hey, we saved uh, on one end and then we just saw you know, an, uh, an appreciation in price on the other. Right, a little retaliation type thing. <laughs> well, you know what it is? And again, it's been a rough ride, you know? Um, and you know, as I said to them, this is, this is not an emotional decision. This is a two year exercise where we're looking at what's in the best interest for the town and the board. And, you know, you, you've got a competitive process where it wasn't just one carrier that offered some value. You know, you had a couple of carriers, although Cigna's the winner, um, you had some things that were bubbling up from Aetna that were compelling. So you had a couple of carriers that um, validated, uh, you know, their own pricing position and, and, and made Aetna or Anthem uh, look obviously uncompetitive from a fixed cost standpoint. Uh, Chris, do you do you feel that convincing all the various unions to go along with this is going to be a struggle, or have you done this before? Yeah, it's it's not an easy lift, Tom. Um, let me share with share with you what we did, and let me share with you where we are. Um, the spreadsheet that you're looking at, we distributed it to the unions. Um, we wanted them to be able to kind of test the assumptions and kind of flex you know, the, the numbers to make sure that they could see how 
A gets the B gets the C. Um, so we shared the numbers with them. Um, on the disruption side, we shared that um, uh, disruption report that essentially said, here is the you know, 3,000 providers that our people saw in the last 12 months. Here's provider name, address, specialty, number of members seen, dollars paid. Are they participating with Anthem and where do they fall under Cigna? Um, I.e., that was that 97% network match. Um, we gave it to them in an Excel manner and said, slice it, dice it any way you want. We were also proactive in saying, let me tell you where the one hole is in this disruption report. We called out providers that fall under the behavioral health side of the ledger. Uh, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, psychiatrists. That is a very personal physician patient relationship. And that's not one you want to disrupt. Um, we found that there were 20 or 25 providers that were part of the uh, Anthem network that were not part of the Cigna network. Cigna came in and said, we will treat these 25, even though they're not in our network, as if they are in our network. And we will look to actively recruit them in the upcoming year. And we'll reassess at the end of the year. And if we found that we've made inroads, great. If we found that we haven't, then we are more than willing to let the town and the board decide if we want to continue that transition of care where we continue to uh, cover them as in network. And that it was a wise and smart thing to ask. And it was a wise and smart thing for them to adhere. We shared that with the union and we said, there's a hole. We don't want these 25 people to be out of network. And here's what Cigna has agreed to do. So from that standpoint, we were very transparent. Same thing on the formulary side. Um, our members generated 22,000 scripts in 2020. Uh, we had Express Scripts highlight, here's the drugs that are under the Anthem formulary, here's the drugs that are under ours, and here's the drugs that fall out. 98% of all drugs that members are filling today, they're going to be able to fill under Express Scripts. No disruption. We gave them that file. We also got a letter from Cigna that said, in building the benefits, we will duplicate benefits. And in those areas where we can't, we will offer a better standard. We got it on letterhead from Cigna addressed to Mike. And we got it on letterhead uh, addressed to Trent Donahue on the Board of Ed side. We gave all of that to the unions. We had four town hall webinars where we invited in all of the union reps and shared with them what's going on. So that was then, this is now. Um, we are working with them to try to bring everybody in and say, folks, we're doing this. We feel compelled that as long as we get by off at the upper echelons, we're doing it. We're sharing with, you know, and I'll, I'll you know, the teachers, the side by side that shows this is what you have under Anthem. This is what you have under Cigna. I'm scheduled to be part of the weekly uh, meeting between the WTA and HR tomorrow at four to kind of go through some of the concerns that the union has. So are we there? No, no. Um, do I feel that we have a very strong argument? Do I feel that this is good financially? Do I feel that it's not disruptive? Yes, um, but until they buy off um, anything, everything is up in the air. Um, we're, try we're doing the same thing on the town side, most notably for the police to get them what they're looking for. Um, you know, this dog will hunt. It is a great proposal. Um, I hope the union see it for what it is and, uh, and agree to come aboard. I think if I can just kind of piggyback on that and, and um, thank you, Chris, you did touch on it with the police department. They are, I think, memory serves the only union that actually has it built into their contract that they have to, um, that it's subject to collective bargaining, which basically means we have to negotiate with them. And we have a plan related to that, but um, we have to go through the, the process to talk to them and um, uh, see what their thoughts are and concerns. So this is not, um, 
you know, just, just to be clear, we still have to have that process and that conversation, but they have been informed. Chris did a great job, I think, presenting to them. They had a number of questions. They do have a consultant on board um, that is reviewing some of the numbers. And so we'll kind of await those discussions. And, and let me leave, um, speak to two comments. Um, there are 40 active police officers enrolled. Um, our population is 550. Um, as a plan B, I went to Blue Cross and said, please give me a fully insured quote if the, T if the police were to be left behind. And they issued that. So as much as I previously said, Anthem would retain the dental, the over 65s, if the police balk, then we could leave those 40 officers behind. Now we wouldn't take the risk on 40 employees, i.e. converting that to a fully insured environment. Um, here's the challenge for the police. And it's a, a, a challenge for the town too. To take on the risk, the rates that Anthem quoted are 20% more than what they're paying today. So again, it's a little bit of mutually assured destruction, right? You know, if the police are adamant in staying behind, well, they're walking into a 20% increase in their rate basis. Now, you know, we pay 80% of the cost, so we would be walking into that as well. But, you know, my counsel is this deal is too good to let it die over 40 individuals, even if it does result in some increased cost. And, and, and I, the hope would be the police would look at it and say, okay, same plan that I have today, I stay behind, I pay a 20% increase. And I'm now exposing myself to 10, 12, 15% increases year after year. I come along with the same plan, um, albeit through a different carrier, then I kind of under, under a more stabilized risk pool and you know, not subject to those types of wild fluctuations. So you know, again, knowing what the process entails, um, we tried to make sure we game planned on plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, if you will, um, just to make sure we tried to corner every contingency. Thanks for that, Chris. That was a lot of helpful information. I can't imagine switching over that number of people. I, it's me and my wife, and we we would hate to switch, you know, with all our doctors and all that stuff, but you got 97% coverage. So I think that's, that's got to be a, uh, a real step in the right direction. Anybody uh, have any questions for Chris? I guess not. So thanks again for that. Folks, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Oh, Brian, you all set? I'm all set. Okay. I was just I was just waving. <laughs> Everybody have a good evening. You, you as well. Thank you. Take care. All right. Mr. O'Neill for another late night. I'm back. Good evening, everyone. Um, I thought what I would do is just very quickly run down this list. Um, this is at the front of your binders and the additional information, but just, just to kind of, I, I always like to kind of make sure everybody appreciates the big picture and, and the ground that we've covered and everything. So the column, the column with the X uh, over it is the proposed budget. This, these are the expenditures. This is the third of, of those four striped pages at the front. So I'm just looking at pages three and four. You know, there's the there's the total budget, the one hundred and twelve thousand in the proposed. But there are just a few kind of I'll call them minor departments that we have not uh, covered with you. And I'm, I'm going to go through those fairly quickly. There's two there's two among them. That I'll go into more detail at the end, but let me let me just run down. And again, so you've you know everybody that's come before you now up to this point has spoken to you know in those worksheets total up to these figures that you see in this column. Um, so just in in terms of running down the ones that we have not covered, town attorney we talked a little bit about that the other night. That's strictly non uh, labor and relations uh, attorney costs in that department. 
Um, and I think you remember seeing the, the actual costs running ahead of you know, that $100,000 uh, traditional number that we always budget. So I, you know, we, we just bumped that up a little bit this year, um, you know, cause it, it, just to make it a little more realistic. Uh, so that's, that's all that's there. Um, probate is uh, the residency or uh, the uh, occupancy costs for the regional probate court in Newington. And those costs get allocated across the three or four towns uh, based on grand list. And so that our estimate there from the court is, uh, is 35,000, which is just a, a modest increase uh, from last year. Town treasurer is, is the two appointed treasurers receive a $1,500 stipend that we pay once a month to them. Uh, central office we looked at with John Eichner uh, on Monday, that's the telecommunications and et cetera there. Emergency medical services is uh, that $12,000 is the $1,000 stipends paid to qualifying um, volunteers from the from the Weathersfield Volunteer Ambulance Association, so it's the it's the thousand dollars stipend plus you know the fringes FICA, Medicare for those. Um, and again, we we contact the association, we ask them how many qualified members they think they expect they'll have, and that's something that gets paid um, right at the beginning of the fiscal year. Central Connecticut Health District. That's uh, that's the town share of the health district. And again, we just get that number from, from Charlie. Contingency, uh, we've used that $340,000 number. As long as I've been here, I don't know the, the rationale behind it, except that it becomes a smaller percentage of the total budget as, as time passes, but it's um, nonetheless sufficient. Um, but that's just for unexpected uh, events you know, that might occur during the year. Um, so that there's there's some cushion in the budget. Is, Mike, is, is that uh, contingency also sometimes referred to as fund balance? Was it four hundred thousand at one point, or is, I'm look, thinking of a different line? You are, Tom. You're thinking of the uh, on the revenue side. So there's yep. a there's an allocation on the revenue side, a use of fund balance, which was a little over two million dollars last year, and that's. That's to to keep the the mill rate down. This is this is because uh, when you adopt the budget, you create you know just a legal appropriation that cannot cannot be exceeded. Um, so we really this just gives us a source of funds to go to. We would come back to you. The charter says we can do budget transfers in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year. Um, so if we knew there was a, a you know, problem of some sort that came up, a, you know, a disaster or something, um, we could, you know, we could move that money to another department to cover um, cleanup costs or something like that. Okay. You know? It's rarely used though. Correct. And that's part of, you know, that's the, that's sort of the first piece that goes into that year end, uh, the, the unexpended funds that you deal with in the summertime. Right. Thanks. Yep. Um, I'm going to come back to insurance. That's a. I'm sorry. Do I just on the issue of the contingency before you move on? I, so every year, if it's not used, it lapses back. You, you said it doesn't just. It's not a special fund that just. You know. It's, this is part of the the operating budget appropriation that that the council authorizes. So we get down in the summertime. We pass June 30th. Uh, we kind of figure out where we are by late July and we come to you and we say, we've got, and I, I don't know if I have, the, I do have it right here. So we had about $800,000 last summer. We came to you and said, $800,000 unexpended. Um, what would you like to do with it? And we make some recommendations. So some of that would lapse the fund balance, or you could choose to transfer it all to various other places in the budget, you know, really primarily, you know, transfers to other reserve accounts is, is what you would do or authorize 
you know, kind of spending on the spot for, for equipment or something like that. But so you, you have the choice. It's the council's uh, prerogative on how to, how to handle that at the end of each fiscal year. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So again, just running down that column and we'll come back to insurance in a moment, but that's, uh, that's the town's uh, property um, liability, auto property, we call it LAP uh, policy and some other smaller items. And MDC we've talked about transfers is just the, the CIP and CNAF transfers. And then this line, uh, retiree medical OPEB um, is, our, is our retiree medical, which I'm gonna uh, talk about after insurance. So let me jump to that. I can't see my There we go. All right, insurance. So the largest, uh, this department, the total is 696,000, 3% increase. Um, largest items here is the liability auto uh, property uh, insurance policy, which is split on two lines. It's right here, the 179 and oh, that's weird. It's the, <laughs> let's panic for a moment. It's, it's in this total. For some reason it's not, it should be in this cell. It's this amount, uh, but thankfully these two totals are the same. I just had a minor heart attack there, but um, so at the 179 and the 441 comprise about almost 90% of that, the total department. Um, this increase is about one and a half percent over what was adopted last year. Uh, our policy is with Kerma. That's another um, interlocal risk pool um, that has about 140 towns that are in it. Um, town's been with Kerma for many years, um, and they've always offered a very um, excellent competitive rate for us. We are in. Uh, in the midst, in the middle of a three-year uh, rate stabilization agreement um, with Kerma for the LAP policy, which caps our increases at 3% annually. Um, our initial indication, we don't have a final rate for next year, but our initial indication from Kerma is a 3% increase. Um, so why do we only have a 1% increase? Because uh, that covers us. We, we had a little bit extra budgeted last year, the actual rate increase was not as high as we had had estimated last year. I think we used 3% last year. It was a little bit less than that. So, so we're starting from a point that it just allows us to, to go up one and a half percent that covers the 3% increase that Kerma is, um, is estimating for us. Um, the other items in here is our broker fee, uh, 32,500. That's uh, we're in the third year of our uh, a three year agreement with uh, USI. Uh, Chris Chris Wardrop, one of uh, Chris Monroe's colleagues, is our uh, he is our broker um, and our consultant. You know on all insurance matters. So that's the that's the fee for his company. I have a little extra money in here for additional property um, that we might add during the year. Um, we get, you know, the, the rate gets, the premium gets adjusted for that. Um, we do have a new item, which is a cybersecurity policy. Uh, we were covered under this, the KERMA policy, the LAP policy um, this year, although it was a shared, a shared uh, policy with all other uh, members of KERMA and it did have a, a cap on the claims. So it's the kind of thing with the increasing prevalence of uh, cyber related losses. Um, Kerma has actually dropped that policy for fiscal 22 next year. Um, so we uh, we're being advised by USI to go out and shop 
for uh, a policy, a standalone policy. Those are running uh, from 20 to 30,000. So we've, we've put in half of 25,000. We would share that with the Board of Ed. Um, so that's what that item is. And then we have some smaller policies, a flood policy for the physical services garage, which is in the floodplain, um, a crime bond, a uh, bond for the tax collector. We have 10,000 in here for uh, deductibles on claims throughout the year um, that we pay, you know, we pay directly, those are deductibles. This, this uh, accident and sickness policy is, is a policy that we uh, provide to volunteer fire uh, fighters. And then we have one uh, underground tank left that, uh, that we have a policy on. Do you know where that is located, Mike? Uh, that one's a town hall for the, uh, yeah, for the generator. If there are no questions, I'll go to the retiree medical. So this this should uh, this sheet should be behind your tab. Um, for, you know, reserve for retirees is what we call it. The total for this department is the $3.5 million, which is a 2.76 increase. The largest components here are these three items. This is, uh, these, these two items are what Chris was talking about a few moments ago. This is our retirees who are under 65 and who remain part of our uh, self-insured pool. This, you know, that's 1.7 million. Uh, this is the over 65 um, that are on the fully insured policy. That's $326,000. And again, it's just a, a, the percentage increases for these two, we're working with about a 2% increase on the, the cost of the, the premium, if you will. Um, but the, the, may, the, the changes really are driven by the movement of employees into this group, you know, typically when they retire and then when they age to 65 into the, into the over 65 group. So, so the real change that you see here, the 112 and the 19,000 is a function of that 2% increase that we're, we're estimating um, plus any movement of individuals in and out of these groups. And this number, you know, this number it continues to go up with the sort of this little bump that we've seen in retirements um, is really kind of driving that number up and, and has done so over the last several years. Um, so those are the two big pieces that, and then this item down here is the contribution to the OPEB trust. OPEB is other post-employment benefits, which is a government accounting term. I don't I prefer to, you know, for, for the sake of presentations like this, referring to it as, as a retiree medical, um, but OPEB seems to be the, the term of art for that, um, for whatever reason. But we, uh, the town adopted, the council adopted a funding plan. So this is, this is viewed, you know, way back 20 years ago, uh, a government accounting standards board said, uh, governments have to look at these benefits, these medical benefits for retirees and treat them the same way that we treat uh, pension plans, which is to say, you have to make an estimate of what the cost of the benefit is, you know, over the, over the retired life of, of the people who qualify. And you have to recognize that cost back at the, you know, at the current point in time and develop a plan to fund it. So, um, the council did that back in 2012, um, created a trust, uh, put some money into that out of, from out of the pension fund, um, and then embarked on a rather aggressive um, plan to add, you know, what ended up being, you know, in the current year, $1.6 million. That, that increased 
by 200,000 every year. Um, we have, uh, happy to say, reached the, the end of the funding plan. Um, this is the point where things tend to level out a bit. And so there's no increase in this item. There's a $0 increase here uh, for this year. Um, it's the 1.6 million, which we share. That's the town share. And the board also um, pays the balance of that. Um, so that's that's something that's that should level out. And we'll begin to look at that since we're no longer on the funding plan, we'll start to look at the valuations, which we do every other year, much like we do a pension valuation. And then we'll rely on um, the recommended contribution from the valuation. So basically the, the idea is we, we had to sort of play catch up by making this, this extra contribution and get ourselves up to the point um, where we were at the contribution amount um, from the valuation. And so we'll have, um, we only do this valuation every other year. Uh, this will be done um, in the summertime into the fall, you know, as we did it two years ago. So there'll be the actuaries at Milliman will be uh, working on that and they will have a, a real uh, from evaluation for us for the next budget. So the recommendation for now is just to simply uh, plateau that and, and stay at the 976,000. So if I'm understanding correctly, the funding plan worked as designed and we don't need to rewrite a funding plan. We're gonna do it by actuarially method or whatever. Yes, yep, and we are, uh, I should have pulled the number out. We're roughly 40% funded. It's a little over 40%, which is a, a fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a, it is a credit to the councils that put this in place and that stuck with this uh, over the last, I think it's eight years. Um, you know, again, there was only conversation once or twice about, and it, all it was was a question, do we have to keep doing this? Can we take a year off? Uh, it was very aggressive, but it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, we are out among uh, the leaders, you know, in terms of, of towns, you know, in dealing with this liability um, to be, and to be at 40% plus funded. So, you know, and by comparison, the pension plan, which has been, you know, dealt with on an actuarial basis, you know, forever is, you know, is, is a little under 80% uh, funded. You know, so to be at 40 is just is is again, it's just a testament to the, you know, the, the commitment by many, many councils to uh, to deal with this cost. Anyone has any questions jump right in. Um, I, I just have a quick question. I, the, um, the OPEB trust fund is invested and I, I can't find it right now, but I, I know you had provided something showing in one of either the budget book or, you know, the binder about, um, how well the investments have performed over the last fiscal year. And, um, I recall it doing very well. And I, so I was gonna ask, but then you made the comments about how no one ever asked this and that's good. So then I wasn't sure I should, but I was just gonna ask, regardless of how well the fund performs, um, you know, the amount that we are putting into it should, is, is sort of set by actuaries. So it shouldn't be adjusted, um, you know, because maybe the performance of the investments was exceeded, you know, that, as, as her expectations. That is always taken into consideration. Um, every 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 new valuation takes that into consideration. So if we have a great uh, a great year in the market, it reduces uh, what we have to put in, mm -hmm. right? Because it's because there's more in the trust. Now, the actuaries, you know, they smooth that out. They do something called asset smoothing. So they take uh, they take those gains over five years. So any given year, we're dealing with 20% of the increase 
from the preceding each of the preceding five years, if you will. But it's it's just a they they average it out over twenty over five years. So um, just to keep again, it, the idea is to keep the whole thing stable and to allow the town to uh, to fund it and to continue to make contributions in a very predictable and have the, have the trust act in a very predictable manner. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So just a couple, maybe uh, there's a couple things I should note, um, particularly based on, on what Chris went through. As I said a moment ago, we've assumed in, in this group, again, this is the self-insured group and in the active employees, um, we've assumed a 2% increase in medical costs. And you can see the other one is here. So the, here's all the departments, here's that health insurance number that you saw in the various department presentations. And you can see down here, uh, and again, so we used a 2% increase and then uh, it's just adjusted for, uh, you know, people, you know, we budget uh, vacancies at family and maybe a vacancy was filled and this year it's, it's, not a, it's not at a family level, it's at a single or a double level, something like that. Um, but regardless, we've, we've budgeted the, at 2%. And we would bring that down if the council decides to approve the, the move to Cigna. You know, we would obviously adjust that here and adjust it at the board as well. I'm pretty sure that uh, Matt used 2% as well um, when he did that, when he did his budget. And then the other thing was he has, um, Can you see my switch that? Did that switch for you? One other on that same line. What's the timing of that? We, we still don't know if the unions are going to agree and uh, our deadline's coming up real fast. Yeah, so we have to um, hustle on our end with the police. And I think, you know, I don't know, Gary, do you want to jump in? Did you have an idea on, you know, maybe one of the, the May meetings or? For us to approve it or for the, the police to? It's, I mean, you know, again, I guess to, to answer your question, Tom, it would be, you know, I don't think it would be prudent to take any savings unless the, the council approved the move. Um, right. So, you know, we got a couple of balls up in the air here, but we, you know, I think we have up until the moment that you adopt the budget to, uh, to approve a move to Cigna. Yeah, I was going to comment. If you need to, you could always do it prior to the budget, right? Or as part of the budget approval process, you would have to, if uh, if it's not on a regular meeting, you'd have to include it as part of the special meeting, but you, you could do a motion. Um, I'll start working with the police department and the police union um, to kind of get back for them. As it stands now, what's the budget approval date? Uh, well, on May 3rd, I'm on the council agenda is the moving the um, extending the date. Right, but if we didn't, what? It's May 15th, which is May 15th Saturday. is your deadline. So originally, I think we slated it for maybe the 13th, Thursday the 13th, because I think there were conflicts on schedule. And is there any way possible that we could get the unions to agree by May 13th? Can only yeah. ask. The thing is, um, you mean, and 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 try to pass the budget the same. Are you concerned about passing it the same day, or you just want to know in, in as far as advance as well, possible? It just seems like we don't have much time at all, even if we extend our date. It's, I, I don't, unless it's easier than what it sounds like. <laughs> Negotiation. Well, don't, don't Chris. Chris had laid out that other option of of letting the police stay behind on a fully insured plan, you know, which still results in savings for the town overall. Right. right. 
But in the order of this, like, can we put it on the agenda for our mon Monday meeting? So we approve it and then we ask the unions or do you want to ask the unions and then we approve it? My personal opinion is you should ask the unions first before you try, only because it just seems like you're trying to jam them up and they know the level of, uh, power that they actually have at that point. And I would rather work with them and answer their questions and make them feel comfortable than feel like I'm taking a hard line on them. Okay. But that doesn't mean I can't get to them. I mean, probably not by May 3rd at this point, but I might be able to have something by May 17th, which is the second council meeting, depending upon what they're, what they're asking for. Okay. I mean, I think we should definitely try and pursue this. So as soon as we can, that'll be good. Thanks, Mike. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. I think that's all I've got for tonight. Questions for Mr. O'Neill? Anybody? So we're working on a couple of things uh, off the top of my head. Um, 10 year history of CIP projects that were approved by the council um, projection of- Just know, the number, Mike. Yeah, just the number number of C, of amount CIP approved. Oh, uh, we, got, we got everything for you. We got all- Okay, kind of, I mean, you don't even- you don't it wasn't, it wasn't, I'm trying to be very narrow. And no, I know you are. Be thoughtful we're, we're, it, wasn't, it wasn't much of a, of, of a bother, to be honest. You know, we okay. pulled it together. Um, the, uh, our projection for this year, that for the operating budget fiscal year that we're in um, through the end of the year, you know, we're, we're pretty close on that. And uh, some pension information we got. We're going to have a little bit of- uh, a little bit of relief there, not not much, but about uh, it looks like about twenty thousand dollars. You know the the number we got the preliminary number earlier today, and it's about twenty thousand dollars less, and I think about sixty thousand less on the board side. So we're we're keeping a tally of of those items. So there's a few things there um, that the board has. Uh, that they can take off their number um, that that they they budgeted an increase in the OPEB contribution. I think that was about seventy eight thousand, um, and then a uh, their half of the the cyber policy they did not budget, so they would have to add that back, and then a, a small reduction for the uh, the pension contribution too. So, but we're gonna we'll have a kind of a one page summary on the uh, the pension and then uh, some other information from the valuation that we talked about uh, last week. Would you expect to have that before our next uh, deliberation meeting or? Yeah, I'll have, I'll have it before the end of the week. Okay, great. I also just had a question or maybe it's something, I don't know if you could answer now or for next time. Um, the tax collection rate estimate, it looks like it's set at 98.95, and I couldn't remember what we ended up setting it at last year, but um, I was wondering if that's the amount that we anticipate we would collect in the current fiscal year or that we will collect overall, because I assume every year there's some um, you know, extra, the delinquent tax revenue coming in, you know. Yep. Well. So, uh, so we use the same estimate that we used last year in the adopted budget, which I think it was last year, maybe the year before that we nudged that up a little bit. Um, last year. You know, we kind of looked at the historical and I think we were at 98.65 and we went up to, what are we at 99, 98.95 now. Yes. Um, so we did that. So, so what we've done in this proposed budget is the same as same as what was adopted last year, um, yeah. <laughs> and that collection rate is just the taxes on the current year levy that are collected in the fiscal year. And we and except that we also count 
um, under accounting principles. Um, there's a magic 60 day grace period after year end, which we can use to include, you know, so anything from that current levy that we collect through August counts for the fiscal year that ends in June. Um, but right, so it doesn't, so there's some piece that's not collected. And then we factor that into all the delinquencies for all tax levy years um, that are uncollected going into the new fiscal year that we're budgeting, right? So there's some amount uh, that we think, you know, it's gonna change a little bit between now and, and June 30th, um, but we kind of know where, where we're gonna be with that number for all those past years. Um, and then we try to figure out how much of that we think we'll collect in the next fiscal year. And that's a separate, that's separate from the, the current levy. Okay. So just to, just to put that up there. So if you go back here, so that's the, that's the current levy. Um, and that is 98.95% of what we think the levy will be based on the grand list. That's what we budget. And then for all the prior years, you know, our, our estimate is 600,000 um, that we would collect during that fiscal year. I, I, I can't honestly remember, Mike, that 98.95 was up towards the higher uh, limit of the prior years, right? Or it's not a lot of room for movement there. Is that what I'm getting at? Yeah, I mean we're you know we're close to close to a hundred, right? So right, right. And we you know and we're also uh, making estimates about the grand list about tax appeals and things like that that we think you know so we take that off the grand list too. We start with with the assessor's number. She well she gives us you know those estimates of appeals and things like that. So we reduce the grand list by that amount. Um, and then use that base to calculate the mill rate. Um, I'm sorry, then we take, we take the collection rate off of that number two, and then we come up with the mill rate. But right, you know, to get to your question, I mean, we're, we're, we're not a lot further to go in that number to pick up, you know, a little bit, you know, and I could kind of do a sensitivity analysis against the mill rate to you know, if anybody was interested in that, but I think it's when you start to get into that 99% range, you know, there's not a lot of uh, wiggle room, not a lot more ground that you can cover to, you know, yeah. look for relief on the mill rate. Is the, uh, the board of assessment items, those are, those are closed though, aren't they? Or is there, do we still have to allow for? It would just be court cases. You know, anybody can, you can, if you go to board assessment appeals, you can, you can go to court. Um, you know, so we have, you know. Do you allow for that somewhere in your? Yeah, that's in, um, in the book, it's on A2. You can see the, uh, the offsets that we do for, for the volunteer tax, uh, the volunteer fire uh, uh, payments, the, the tax abatements that we do and, and some other items. We have some some other abatements on some uh, some properties. That's all there. I recall last year um, in the initial budget, the collection rate was set lower than usual because we were anticipating people being unable to pay their taxes due to the pandemic and the financial collapse. Um, and so it was, and we ended up bumping it up I don't rem but I thought it was not really, I mean, these are, you know, we're close to 99. And so we're talking small numbers, but I thought we bumped it up to sort of the, what it's usually set at, or maybe even a hair under what it's usually set at. I could be wrong, but I vaguely remember this. I'm just trying to find ways to, yeah. you know, we can I'll increase our projected revenues. That would be. Fantastic. I'll get a, I'll get a recent history on that. because. Right. I know we had the discussion because we were at this point last year trying to figure out um, which of those two options, right, for the pandemic on tax relief. Was it going to be the lowered interest rate or the, uh, you know, deferral of the due date, you know, by three months? And we did some cash flow analysis. And we, you're right, we did uh, 
you know, we did some scenarios on the collection rate too, but my memory is we, we went back to where we had been in fiscal 20 and then we increased it, but I'll just get, I'll get the, you know, five or six year history on that for you. Okay. I, I think the do, I, I want to, I think Mary, I think the dollar amount was like 300,000, I think is, was the adjustment in terms of dollars and cents from what I remember. Anyone else? Anything? That's it. Gary, do we have anything else that we need to cover tonight? Or? Not at all. Uh, one other thing, hold on. The dates in the budget book for deliberations, I think were originally well, there, there's a question of May 5th and May 10th. And then at one point or another, I had May 6th as a potential date. And I guess what I want to throw out to the group is the idea of it probably makes sense to have it as May 5th and May 10th. This way, if there's any questions asked on the 5th, it would give Mike O'Neill, myself, and any other department heads opportunity to have it prepared and completed by the 10th versus trying to do something on May 5th and May 6th. So I'm kind of throwing it out there to the group. So maybe any concerns with May 10th, May 5th and May 10th. Mike, those were the dates, right? That we were. Yeah. What date was? I don't have a calendar here. Uh, Monday, May, I'm sorry, Wednesday, May 5th and Monday, May 10th. So I'm gonna just kind of put those out there as dates so that we can notice the public. That's pretty much all I have. And can we put it the fifth and the sixth and then cancel it at the last minute or you're not allowed to do that? I mean, you're allowed to do it. Um, uh, you know, it, it's typically we can add a, it's easier to add a third later than it is to try to, I mean, I, I can do whatever you guys want. We could, we could keep three days. Typically what we do is, um, you know, a, a deliberations, two deliberations. And then if we need to, we add the third right before the vote um, because we might be voting on the third to extend it. I guess right. my thought is if you do extend it, you're gonna have time in between. Um, I can do it either way. We can add it or we can subtract it as long as I give public needs at least 24 hours notice. When you said extended, maybe I, I might have missed something there just for a second. What are you extending? Well, we haven't, you and I haven't met for agenda ses setting yet, but uh, <laughs> but the but the agenda, there will be an agenda item to match the governor's executive order, uh, an agenda item for consideration to extend the vote on the budget past the May 15th deadline to another date. Um, to allow for final numbers from the governor's budget and an explanation of the usage for the um, American recovery funds. And this is past our, I mean, we've got a, it's in our charter, right? So correct. There's, there's a statute which allows us to breach the charter. The governor uh, issued an executive order allowing municipalities to discuss and extend if so agreed upon by the legislative body, like last year. But if we're going to extend it, is that we have to do it by May 3rd or isn't there something like that? Or you have to do it at a council meeting and the only council meeting prior to May 15th is May 3rd. Okay. So if we're going to extend it, it has to be Monday. Yeah. Correct. Unless you wanted to do a special meeting later on, but that just convolutes it. We can, we can extend it and then end up resolving all our issues and finalizing the budget much earlier, right? Yeah, I mean, you, nothing stops you from doing it earlier. Gives us a little more time with uh, Chris, with the insurance and- Yep. 
couple other items that are up in the air. So is that the consensus that we have it the fifth and the tenth? Is that go that route? I'm good with five and ten. Yep. I mean it's a proper schedule. It allows you to even have one if you want to adopt before the 15th. You know, you can do it on Friday the 14th or something like that. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, we get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Nice job, Deputy. Nice job, Deputy Mayor. Catch yep. you all. See you, Matt. Always a good time. Always a good time. You should go well, home. Are you leaving soon? Uh, I've got, sorry, I'm just kidding. I've got, uh, you know what? I think I'm going home. I was going to respond to a couple of emails. I'm just beat. I'm done. It's been a long freaking week. Apparently, there's something wrong with my camera. <laughs> All right, you go home too. It's nine o'clock. I am. Um, I'm going to go grab the car and I'll, maybe I'll be driving by you. You go up to Walker Hill, you go to South Sydney Highway. Nine o'clock. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going just. I'll go Wolcott Hill. <laughs> All right, maybe I won't see you then. I thought I saw you on the last meeting though when I was pulling around. I'm like, oh, there's someone pulling out. If the, if the package stores were still open, I would probably, oh, we're still recording. Great. <laughs> we'll see you later. I'll see you.